I'd like to call this hearing to order this morning. Uh, this is the 19th day of our American Energy Initiative hearing, and today we're going to focus on uh, two particular pieces of bipartisan energy legislation. The first one is the Resolving Environment and Grid Reliability Conflicts Act of 2012, and the second is the Hydropower Regulatory Efficiency Act of 2012. Now, the Resolving Environmental and Grid Reliability Conflicts Act is a bipartisan bill brought forward by our colleagues Mr. Olson, Mr. Doyle, and Mr. Green. And I understand that Mr. Green may not be here today because he has a he was called out to do something else, but you're here, Mr. Doyle, so that's great. But this legislation amends the uh, Federal Power Act to clarify that when an electric utility complies with a DOE order to generate electricity in order to prevent a reliability emergency, the generator will not be considered in violation of conflicting environmental laws, uh, which has been a problem uh, in many situations. The other bill under consideration today is hydropower legislation developed by Representatives Kathy McMorris Rogers and Diane DeGette. This legislation is another example of a bipartisan effort uh, by Ms. McRogers and uh, Diane DeGette. And of course, one of the primary impediments to greater utilization of hydropower resources is the regulatory red tape, which has proven costly, time-consuming, and burdensome even for small, very small hydropower plants. And at this time, I would like to uh, recognize Mrs. Uh, Rogers uh, to make any additional comments she might want to make about this legislation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you very much for holding the hearing on this legislation. I also want to thank our witnesses who are going to be testifying before the subcommittee today. In eastern Washington, hydro plays a foundational role, whether it's conventional, small, conduit, hydro. In fact, hydropower provides two-thirds of electricity in, in eastern Washington and to the Pacific Northwest. And I, and I recognize there's a, a vast array of clean, green energies, including solar, wind, nuclear. But in my opinion, hydro's potential should not be overlooked in the important role that it can play in helping make America energy independent. In fact, we could double hydropower electricity in this country without building a new dam, simply by investing in new technologies and up upgrades. Only 3% of the current dams produce electricity. That's part of the reason that Cong Congresswoman Diane DeGette and I have been working to expand hydropower production. Today, this committee will examine our bill, the Hydropower Regulatory Efficiency Act. This legislation would facilitate the development of hydropower and condu conduit projects through several common sense reforms, such as updating the FERC license exemption standard to streamline the development of more small hydro projects, giving, giving FERC the option to exempt hydro projects generating under 10 megawatts uh, and conduit projects generating between 5 and 40 megawatts from the permitting process. Uh, also allowing FERC to extend the term of a preliminary permit for up to two years for a total of five years in order to allow a permittee sufficient time to develop and file a license application. Our bill is timely and targeted, and it will help create jobs and encourage America's competitiveness in the energy sector. I'd also like to take this opportunity to introduce one of our witnesses on today's second panel. I've had the privilege of knowing Andrew Monroe for the past few years. Andrew serves on the Grant County Public Utility District in Washington State. He formerly served as the president, CEO, and chairman of the board of the National Hydropower Association. Andrew understands the importance of this legislation and sees it as a stepping stone for future hydropower legislation. Again, I thank all the witnesses for participating and for the chairman uh, for taking the time to hold this uh, hearing today. Thank you. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to recognize uh, Ms. Capps of California. Uh, Mr. Rush is not with us this morning, but uh, you're recognized for five minutes. Ms. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I want to welcome our witnesses who are, being, who are here today to testify. And at today's hearing, as the Chairman has said, the subcommittee will examine two pieces of legislation. The first measure is a non-controversial hydropower bill, 
which we heard Ms. McMorris Rogers explain, also co-sponsored by Ms. DeGette. It's encouraging to see bipartisan cooperation to promote the types of hydropower that are environmentally responsible. We have significant hydropower potential in California, including in my district on the Central Coast. When developers and environmentalists can agree on a common framework to utilize some of these resources in ways that are broadly supported, I think it's a good step in the right direction. On the other hand, I have serious concerns about the Olson bill. Under the Federal Power Act, the Department of Energy has the authority to issue emergency orders to require the generation or transmission of electricity when grid reliability is threatened. Historically, this authority has been used sparingly. In fact, it has been only used six, okay, on six occasions since 1978. These emergency orders are a measure of last resort. The Olson bill would provide an, any entity operating under a DOE emergency order with a blanket waiver of all environmental liability that could result from actions necessary to carry out the order. We certainly don't want to force a company to choose between complying with the DOE order and complying with environmental laws, but that kind of conflict has proven to be exceedingly rare. <clears throat> There's only one case from six years ago that arguably even falls into that category. In trying to address those rare conflicts, we need to make sure we don't create bigger problems. As currently drafted, the Olson bill has the potential to become a major loophole that could allow utilities to dodge compliance with environmental requirements. We need to avoid that outcome. The language of the Federal Power Act provision is quite broad. If we add a sweeping liability shield to that broad authority, we may have utilities lining up around the block to get a DOE order so they can avoid meeting environmental standards and installing modern pollution controls. <clears throat> Under current law, operators have strong incentives to act responsibly and to comply with environmental requirements. With no risk of liability for violations of environmental law, the incentives would be very different. We want to make sure the lights stay on, and we all want to treat companies fairly. But let's not throw caution to the wind as we try to address an issue that has affected just one company in the last 35 years. DOE and EPA are raising serious concerns about the Olson bill. We should take those concerns seriously and approach this issue in a thoughtful and balanced way. I thank all of today's um, witnesses for being here again, and I look forward to your testimony. At this point, the remainder of my time, I would be happy to yield uh, to uh, the gentleman from Pennsylvania, my colleague, Mr. Doyle. Uh, I thank my colleague. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, as you know, I'm co-sponsor of the bill that uh, Ms. Capsch just talked about. This bill is a product of many months of work, including consultation with Chairman Upton's staff, Ranking Member Waxman's staff, the Department of Energy, various electricity providers, and many others. <coughs> Admittedly, it has been a difficult needle to thread. But I want to remind everybody on this committee, as we have debated numerous EPA regulations that will affect power providers, I have supported greenhouse gas regulations, federal regulation of coal ash, regulations for industrial boilers, and most recently the mercury and air toxic standards. In fact, at this committee's hearing on the MAX rule in February, I said, and I quote, here we are trying to sort through claims that 24 years was not long enough for the power sector to prepare and a potential five additional years of compliance time provided by the rule, totaling to a full 29 years since the power sector knew controlling mercury would be required is simply too onerous. The time has come and the time is now, so let us see what we can do about ensuring the rule that has the least negative impact possible on those who matter most, the American consumer. What I simply want to make clear is that this bill before us today is not intended as a way out of compliance with any EPA regulations. But the fact remains coal-fired power plant retirements are being announced nearly every month. Since last year, over 106 coal-fired power plants have announced their intention to shut down. It is my hope that these retirements will be managed safely by regional transmission authorities. However, should something go wrong, like an unexpected severe weather event, we have one tool of last resort, emergency orders issued under Section 202C of the Federal Power Act. Whether these issues, uh, orders are issued once, twice, or a hundred times, it is never acceptable for the Federal Government to require actions from a company that necessitates a choice of which law to violate. This bill attempts to resolve this conflict in a very narrow and responsible way. 
I look forward to working with my colleagues as the bill moves through committee. And Mr. Chairman, uh, I do have a statement for the record from uh, Mr. Green, who was unable to be at the hearing today, and I would ask unanimous consent that it be inserted into the record. Thank you. This time I'd like to recognize the Chairman of the Full Committee, Mr. Upton of Michigan, for five minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Today we have two very important pieces of bipartisan legislation before us. And I want to commend my colleagues for their hard work and for reaching across the aisle to find common ground in developing both of these bills. Ms. McMorris Rogers and Ms. DeGette worked together to develop a critical piece of hydropower legislation, the Hydropower Regulatory Efficiency Act of 2012. We know that hydropower is the nation's largest renewable energy resource, and the bill before us today will help facilitate the development of a new hydropower resource. It accomplishes that goal without new subsidies or deficit spending. Instead, it cuts through the red tape to make it easier for this renewable resource to come online to power our communities. This is what all of the above is all about. It in turn will stimulate job growth as new hydropower resources are constructed and operated while the electricity produced by these new projects will provide low-cost power to American homes and businesses. Legislation has great promise for increased hydropower development including my state of Michigan, which has significant potential for small hydro projects. In addition, in addition, Michigan manufacturers produce many of the components vital to the hydropower industry, enhancing the positive economic benefits. The other bill under consideration today is Resolving Environmental and Grid Reliability Conflicts Act of 2012, authored by Mr. Olson, Mr. Doyle, and Mr. Green. It is clear that the nation's generation fleet will be undergoing a significant shift over the next several years and beyond. And although we may disagree on why it's occurring or what the impacts will be, we should be able to agree that ensuring the reliable supply of electricity is paramount. That's why H.R. 4273 is such a critical piece of legislation. The bill protects our nation's electricity producers from being penalized or sued for violating a conflicting environmental law when they have been directed by the federal government to operate during an emergency. Government can't have it both ways. It can't direct a generator to operate for emergency purposes and then turn around and fine them for doing so. It's like having one police officer telling you to speed up while another sits at the end of the street to give you a ticket. It's not fair, which is why I'm pleased that our colleagues have developed this bipartisan legislation. So uh, with that, I will yield to any of my colleagues who wish time. Seeing none, I yield back the balance of my time. Mr. Olson, did you want my time? Do you want it? I thought I had did some own time, but it's I'll yours. No, no. Uh, he, Mr. Olson is correct. Uh, Mr. Barton, is my understanding, is not going to give a statement, and that. So, Mr. Olson, I recognize you for five minutes for your opening. Okay. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the chairman of the full committee for his hospitality, and thank you, Chairman, for bringing HR 4273, the Resolving Environmental and Grid Reliability Conflict Conflicts Act of 2012 before the subcommittee. I also want to thank the witnesses for appearing here today to provide their input on this important piece of legislation, which removes electricity generators from the catch-22 of conflicting legal mandates that complicate electricity emergencies and threaten grid reliability. I introduced H.R. 4273 with bipartisan support. I'd like to thank my colleagues, Mr. Green and Mr. Doyle, for being original co-sponsors, to clarify Congress's intent that compliance with an emergency order issued by the Department of Energy should not be considered a violation of any federal, state, or local environmental laws or regulations. This common sense legislation is extremely irrelevant today as the Environmental Protection Agency, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, and the Department of Energy and others have acknowledged that grid reliability could be threatened due to accelerated power plant closures. Secretary Chu, in this hearing, this hearing room last, week, last month, expressed support for the concept of holding power generators harmless when they exceed emission limits when ordered to do so by the grid regulator. One of the safety valves in the toolbox is DOE's authority to mandate power generation and trans transmission under Section 202C of the Federal Power Act. It is no silver bullet, but it is a fallback in times of true emergency. However, as we hear from our witnesses today, 
202C cannot work effectively unless Congress passes legislation like H.R. 4273 to resolve the potential conflict between the DOE mandate and environmental regulations. Absent legislative action, the risks and costs associated with temporary noncompliance with environmental requirements could prohibit a company from complying with the energy order, placing reliability in jeopardy. If my home state of Texas has another exceptionally hot summer like they did last summer and the power is shut off, air conditioning goes off, lives will be at risk, particularly elderly and the young ones. In fact, last week in my home city of Sugarland, Texas, a young infant died in an automobile when the heat rise to 90 degrees. 90 degrees. We had 100 degree heat last summer. If that happens again and the grid goes down, people's lives will be at risk. This legislation has bipartisan support because it simply ensures a common sense solution to protect grid reliability when it is most needed. I urge my colleagues to support H.R. 4273 to protect grid reliability and provide certainty to electric, provi electric providers. And Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent to include records of support from legislation from the uh, American Public Power Association, the National Rural Electric Cooperative Association, the Electric Power Supply Association, the Edison Electric Institute, the Industrial Energy Consumers of America, and the Midwest Power Coalition. I ask unanimous consent that these, these letters of support be inserted record. Without objection. Yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Olson. Uh, Mr. Waxman, uh, was delayed a little bit this morning, so we're going to proceed with the hearing, but when he comes in, uh, I'm just going to interrupt and give him an opportunity to make his opening statement at that time. I also want to welcome uh, our uh, witnesses today. We, we have two panels, and uh, we genuinely appreciate all of you taking time to come up and give us your views and expertise on uh, these two pieces of legislation. I might also say that we, we do these hearings and it really does take a major effort by everyone, by the witnesses, by the staff, and a lot goes into every hearing that we have. And uh, we've had a lot of hearings and we've repeatedly requested that testimony from witnesses that we receive it two days in advance of the hearing simply because it gives us an opportunity to more thoroughly uh, review and ass assess and look at the uh, views of those witnesses. And uh, unfortunately, once again, uh, Ms. McCarthy, we didn't get your testimony until yesterday around 5, after 5 o'clock yesterday, and, and Ms. Hoffman, we didn't get yours until after 5 uh, yesterday which was considerably later than what we had really asked for. Now, I know everyone has a lot of demands on their time, and we've talked about this before, but I would really appreciate if in the future you all would make a real effort to get that testimony here uh, at least two days before so that we can uh, more thoroughly do our job as well. So uh, thank you for being here and uh, at this time uh, Ms. Hoffman I'll recognize you for five minutes for your opening statement. Good morning Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today to discuss the Department of Energy's emergency authority under section 202C of the Federal Power Act and the proposed legislation intended to address the use of this authority and potential conflicts with other federal state and local laws and regulations. Currently, under 202C of the Federal Power Act, the Secretary can order a generator to operate or a grid connection to be made when, for example, outages occur due to weather events or equipment failures, or when there is or may be insufficient electricity supply available that has the potential to cause a blackout. Section 202C orders are issued only if a determination is made that an emergency exists due to a sudden increase in the demand for electricity for electric energy or a shortage of electric energy or a shortage of facilities for the generation or transmission of electric energy. The Secretary's 202C order can direct the temporary connection or operation of facilities for generation, delivery, interchange, or transmission of electricity in order to best meet the emergency and serve the public interest. 
the department views the issue, issuance of 202C orders as a measure of last resort to be used only during and in the face of imminent emergencies. Since the department was formed in 1978, the secretary has exercised this emergency authority for only six events. Past 202C orders were issued to address circumstances such as inadequate supply of electricity during the 1999-2001 California electricity crisis, in response to the 2003 blackout, to address reliability issues resulting from the devastation caused by hurricanes, and to ensure compliance with reliability standards to prevent potential blackouts. Section 202C orders are not intended to provide a long-term alternative to environmental compliance. They are available only under limited emergency situations and are temporary solutions to imminent reliability threats. If a 202C emergency results from inadequate planning, DOE expects the affected entities to take the necessary steps to resolve the problem in order to avoid the need for a continuing emergency order. Generators subject to a 202C order are required to operate in compliance with all other applicable laws to the extent possible, and after the reliability threat has been eliminated, the affected generator is still expected to comply with all relevant environmental statutes. The department is aware of only one instance where a potential conflict between the emergency order issued under Section 202C and the environmental statutes. It was the 2005 Potomac River Generation Station order. In this case, Merant, now Genon Energy Inc., ceased operation of a Potomac River Generation Station in response to a letter from the Virginia Department of Environmental Quality requesting that Merant undertake actions as necessary to the protection of human health and environment in the area surrounding the plant. In the response, in response to a request from the D.C. Public Service Commission, the Secretary issued a 202C order requiring the plant to run to ensure compliance with reliability standards for the central D.C. area. Over the next several months, the Department worked closely with EPA and the Virginia DEQ to minimize environmental impacts. The administration works to ensure that current statutory authorities work together especially in the context of 202C authority. DOE, re DOE recognizes the importance of working closely with the environmental authorities to achieve the necessary balance between ensuring reliability and addressing emergencies and achieving environmental protection. Regarding the proposed changes to Section 202C of the Federal Act, at this time the administration has not taken a position on H.R. 4273. Anytime generators anticipate reliability issues, they should immediately start planning and working with their grid operators and EPA. As proposed, the amendment to 202C could potentially create a disincentive for some generators to use the compliance options EPA provided. Again, DOE's 202C authority is one of last resort and should not be viewed as an alternative to working with EPA on environmental compliance with grid operators on any potential reliability issues. The administration works to ensure statutory authorities work together to enable both the reliable operation and electricity of the electric system and the environmental protection. At the same time, Section 202C emergency authority will be considered only when necessary and is not an alternative to environmental compliance, even on a temporary basis. DOE will continue to work through potential conflicts to ensure reliability is met and public interest is served when exercising its 202C authority. This concludes my statement, Mr. Chairman, and I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. McCarthy, you're recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chairman Whitfield, Ranking Member, uh, Ranking Member Rush, members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Initially, let me emphasize that EPA completely agrees with the goal of maintaining the reliability of the electricity grid. The lights have not gone out in the past due to Clean Air Act regulations, and our rules won't cause them to go out in the future. However, it's not clear to me what real-world problem this legislation is attempting to solve. 
to the extent that others see potential problems, it's important to resolve any reliability issues that do arise in more rather than less environmentally protective ways. This bill decreases the incentives to do so and could have unintended consequences, creating problems that would not otherwise exist. Section 202C history does not demonstrate the need for legislation to override environmental requirements. The Department of Energy has invoked Section 202 sparingly, and only the, and only the 2005 order concerning the Merrant Potomac River Generating Station appears to have had claims that compliance resulted in a conflict with environmental requirements. But two points are important to understand. First, DOE, EPA, and the Virginia Department of Environmental Quality work cooperatively with one another and with Merrant. DOE's 202C order minimized the likelihood of violations of environmental requirements, and EPA's administrative order allowed continued operation of the plant, but it minimized adverse environmental consequences. Secondly, DOE's order apparently did not require that Merrant violate any environmental law. Although Virginia later fined Merrant $30,000 for environmental violations while operating pursuant to the DOE order, our understanding is, it, as, is that this fine was not a violation compelled by the order. Rather, Virginia found that Merrant could have operated the plant in compliance with the DOE and EPA orders, but they simply failed to do so. A Section 202C order is a tool of last resort. It's really been invoked and virtually never implicated any conflict with environmental compliance because affected parties and regulators have a very strong record of addressing potential reliability issues before conflicts arise. EPA's recently promulgated power sector regulations, including the mercury air toxic standards or MATS rule, do not create a new rationale for amending 202C. The EPA and DOE's analysis projected that the vast majority, if not all of the sources, will be able to comply with MATS within the Clean Air Act timeframes. In addition, the MATS 3 year compliance date, uh, in addition to the MATS 3 year compliance date, EPA is encouraging permitting authorities to make a fourth year broadly available, and EPA is providing a clear pathway for units that are shown to be critical for electric reliability to obtain a schedule to achieve compliance within up to an additional year beyond the four. A 202C order is not required to get that fifth year. When faced with the need to resolve reliability issues, current law provides important incentives to select more rather than less environmentally sound solutions. This legislation could change that incentives. In fact, the legislation could have the unintended con consequence of creating problems that wouldn't otherwise arise, increasing the likelihood of conflicts between reliability and compliance with environmental laws. The bill shields power plants from liability for violations of environmental laws without regard to whether the owner of that facility took responsible actions to comply with environmental requirements or to mitigate reliability concerns. This would eliminate important incentives for owners to take expeditious actions to comply with environmental requirements and avoid conflicts of this nature. By decreasing incentives for environmental protective ways of addressing any reliability issues that might emerge, this bill could unnecessarily delay needed public health protections. If the bill results in 202C orders that would not exist under current law, it increases the likelihood that facilities will operate in, in violation of environmental regulations. Additionally, the hortatory statement that DOE should minimize conflicts with environmental laws is not adequate. The bill, as currently drafted, significantly decreases current incentives for input from EPA and the state and local environmental officials on how best to craft orders that are more rather than less environmentally sensitive. Over the 40-year history of the Clean Air Act, stakeholders working together with state and federal regulators have had an outstanding track record of, sustain of substantially reducing pollution while maintaining reliability. In light of this situation, we encourage the committee to very carefully consider the potential unintended consequences of this bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. McCarthy, thank you. And uh, 
Uh, I neglected to say this, but Ms. Hoffman uh, is the Assistant Secretary for the Office of uh, Electricity Delivery and Energy Reliability at the Department of Energy. And of course, Gina McCarthy is the Assistant Administrator for Air and Ra Radiation from the EPA. And Mr. Moeller is a Commissioner over at the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, and I would recognize him for five minutes at this time. Chairman Whitfield, members of the subcommittee, thank you for the invitation to testify on H.R. 4273, the Resolving Environmental and Grid Reliability Con Conflicts Act of 2012. My name is Phil Moeller, and I serve as one of four sitting commissioners at the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, FERC. I appreciate your interest in addressing the important issues facing the nation's reliable supply and delivery of electricity. Along with myself, my three colleagues, Chairman John Willinghoff, Commissioner John Norris, and Commissioner Cheryl LaFleur, all support the concept behind H.R. 4273. That is, we all agree that generators of electricity should not be put in a position of having to choose whether to violate Section 202C of the Federal Power Act or whether to violate the Clean Air Act when certain generating facilities are needed for crucial electric reliability needs. The testimony of the next panel will describe occasions when generators were forced to make this difficult choice. The electric power grid can roughly be divided into two categories. The bulk power system, which carries electricity at generally high voltage over great distances, and the distribution system, which takes electricity from the bulk system to serve local needs, such as the needs of a town or city. While short disruptions of local service are common for many people during thunderstorms and other weather-related events, the high reliability of the bulk power grid ensures that wide-scale blackouts are extremely unusual. But to ensure that the bulk power grid continues to be reliable, Section 202C of the Federal Power Act permits the Federal Government to require a power plant to run in certain, certain circumstances even if the owner of that power plant would rather not run the plant. In short, the security of this nation depends on a reliable power grid, and Section 202C addresses the need of this nation to have a reliable system. Ideally, we hope that Section 202C will never need to be invoked, but experience indicates that orders under 202C are sometimes necessary. Yet the very operation of a power plant in compliance with, with a Section 202C order can result in a violation of the Clean Air Act. In this sense, federal law can sometimes require the owners and operators of a power plant to violate either the Clean Air Act or the Federal Power Act. The law should not require citizens to choose which law to violate. Our nation has always faced unique challenges to electric reliability, and these challenges could accelerate as older power plants gradually retire or run less frequently, as new technologies allow new power sources to compete with traditional power plants, and as environmental mandates change. While the commissioners at FERC sometimes disagree on the extent to which electric reliability can be threatened by the mandates of the Environmental Protection Agency, EPA, all of the FERC commissioners support the concept that the law should not require a generator to decide whether to violate the Clean Air Act or the Federal Power Act. At this time, the Commission is working to formulate a role in advising the EPA on the reliability impacts of retiring or retrofitting various power plants in compliance with EPA regulations. Regardless of how well FERC and EPA can coordinate their reliability efforts, a bill like H.R. 4273 is essential to address potential reliability challenges. Like 202C more broadly, we hope that the provisions in a bill like H.R. 4273 would never need to be invoked, but erring on the side of reliability is the responsible approach. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify, and I look forward to working with you in the future and answering any questions today. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Moeller. And uh, our last witness on the first panel is Mr. Jeffrey Wright, who is the Director of Office of Energy Projects uh, at FERC. So, uh, Mr. Wright, thank you for being here, and we recognize you for five minutes. Thank you. Chairman Whitfield, members of the subcommittee, again, my name is Jeff Wright. I'm the Director of the Office of Energy Projects at the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. <clears throat> I appreciate the opportunity to appear before you to discuss the draft, draft legislation entitled the Hydropower Regulatory Efficiency Act of 2012. The views I express in my testimony are my own. 
The Commission regulates over 1,600 non-federal hydropower projects at over 2,500 dams pursuant to Part 1 of the Federal Power Act, or FPA. Together, these projects represent 54 gigawatts of hydropower capacity, more than half of all the hydropower in the U.S. The FPA authorizes the Commission to issue licenses and exemptions for projects within its jurisdiction. About 71 percent of the hydropower projects regulated by the Commission have an installed capacity of 5 megawatts or less. The Commission has seen an increased interest in small hydropower projects and has responded by implementing measures to facilitate efficient review of project proposals, including the following, adding new web-based resources to the Commission's website to make it easier for applicants to understand and complete the licensing process, updating or creating MOUs with other agencies to improve coordination, continuing our small hydropower hotline and email address to answer applicant questions, and educating potential small hydropower developers through an education and outreach program. With this background, I will turn to the draft legislation. Section 3 would increase the limit for small hydropower exemptions from 5 megawatts to 10 megawatts. Section 4 would establish various measures to promote conduit hydropower projects. These proposals are consistent with the Commission's policy to promote small hydro generation. Specifically, Section 4A would amend Section 30 of the FPA to establish a procedure whereby conduit projects with an installed capacity of 5 megawatts or less would not re be required to be licensed, provided the applicant makes a showing that the project qualifies as a conduit project. I support this provision, which would serve to increase the amount of electric generation derived from conduits. This section would also allow the Commission to grant conduit exemptions for all projects with an installed capacity of over 5 megawatts and up to 40 megawatts. Section 5 of the uh, draft legislation would amend the FPA to authorize the Commission to extend the term of a preliminary permit issued under FPA Section 5 for up to two years. Preliminary permits grant the holder a first-to-file preference with respect to license applications for projects being studied under a permit. Commission staff has heard that the need for environmental studies in some instances make it difficult to complete a license application within the current three-year term of the permit, with the result that a developer which has invested substantial time and money studying a project may face the possibility of losing its project based on competition from other entities if it needs to seek a subsequent permit. I therefore support the proposed FPA amendment, which could eliminate this problem, and it might be worth considering as an alternative authorizing the Commission to issue permits for terms up to five years, which could avoid the need for developers to go through the process of seeking an extension. Section 6 would require the Commission to investigate the feasibility of implementing a two-year licensing process for hydropower development at existing non-power dams and for closed-loop pump storage projects. I support the goal of an expedited licensing process. It is Commission staff's goal to act on all license applications as quickly as possible. Um, quickly as possible, and we have established procedures that allow for great flexibility and efficiency. I am thus, though, not certain whether an additional licensing process is necessary. We have been able to issue licenses in a matter of a few months where the project proponent has selected a site wisely, stakeholders had agreed on information needs, and state and federal agencies performed their responsibilities quickly. Moreover, the Commission operates under significant constraints imposed by the FPA and by other legislation affecting the licensing process including the Clean Water Act, the Coastal Zone Management Act, the Endangered Species Act, and the National Historic Preservation Act, among them. In the absence of the ability to waive sections of the FPA and other acts or to set enforceable schedules in licensing proceedings, it's not clear that the Commission, under its existing authorities, can mandate a shortened process. Section 7 would require the Department of Energy to study the flexibility and reliability that pump storage facilities can provide and the opportunities and potential generation from conduits. While I cannot speak for the Department of Energy, I do support such research. In conclusion, there is a great deal of potential for the development of additional hydropower projects throughout the country, including small projects. Working within the authority given it by Congress, the Commission continues to adapt its existing flexible procedures to facilitate the review and, where appropriate, the approval of such projects. Commission staff remains committed to exploring with all stakeholders every avenue for the responsible development of our nation's hydropower potential. The legislation under consideration will assist in realizing that potential. This concludes my remarks. I would be pleased to answer any questions you may have. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Wright, and thank all of you for your uh, testimony. 
At this time, I recognize myself for five minutes of uh, questions. <clears throat> you know, we find ourselves today in a situation where uh, we have a plethora of regulations that are coming out of EPA that are having significant impact on the energy sector, uh, production of electricity, as well as on the transportation side. In addition to that, we've been struggling with our <clears throat> economy and we're trying, and demand has been lower uh, for electricity and uh, other energy needs than some t times in the past, and we're making an effort to stimulate the economy, keep growing again. And with this, all of this change taking place, and you see a lot of coal plants closing down today because of regulation and also because of uh, low natural gas prices. And so there is a significant change going on in our country in the electric uh, energy sector. And everyone uh, talks about uh, that we need an all of the above energy program. And <clears throat> I was looking at President Obama's website the other day on his campaign and I really was actually disturbed by it. And I would just like to ask the clerk if she would put up this uh, campaign website of President Obama. <clears throat> now, you may not be able to read that, but the thing that bothers me about it is that President Obama has gone around the country, like many of us, and he's talked about we want an all of the above energy policy. And in that circle, on his campaign site, he talks about the energy sectors. He talks about oil, natural gas, fuel efficiency, biofuels, wind, solar, and nuclear. Now there's one glaring absence, and that happens to be coal, which still provides almost 50 percent of the electricity in America. And uh, Many of us get upset about that because it has a tremendous economic impact on our country. It provides a lot of jobs, and it makes us competitive in the global marketplace because coal is still a valuable resource. We have 250-year reserve of coal, and yet this administration has been openly in the business of putting coal out of business. And for the president to go run around talking about all the above energy policy and even on his campaign website to not even mention coal as an important energy sector is unbelievable to me. Now, we're talking about reliability today on one of these bills and the ensuring reliability and the conflict between environmental laws and reliability and I don't see how anyone could have a problem with this legislation because we're talking about emergency orders that puts companies in conflict between an environmental law and an emergency order from, F from the Department of Energy. And with these reliability issues becoming more and more prevalent, I think we're going to see more and more of this conflict. And uh, I'm delighted, Mr. Moeller, that at FERC uh, they feel like this is something that we should certainly explore. And I'm disappointed that uh, Ms. Hoffman and you, Ms. McCarthy, are not willing to uh, support this kind of legislation. Uh, and I might, I, I said I was going to ask a question. I guess I haven't asked a question yet. But <laughs> so this is my second opening statement. But. Uh, we talk about this Utility Act. I really get upset about it because that Utility Act was sold to the American people that we were going to reduce mercury emissions. And that's all that anyone ever talked about. We're going to reduce mercury emissions, maybe by 0.001% or whatever. And we've had testimony from all sorts of groups saying that the technology is not there to meet the requirement. But more important than that, when the analysis was done of EPA's own figures, the experts said there is no benefit significantly 
from reducing mercury emissions. All of the benefits of the Utility Act, which is the most costly regulation ever issued, all of the benefits comes from reduction of particulate matter, which is already regulated under another aspect of the Clean Air Act. So my time's already expired now. So, uh, But I wanted to get that off my chest because I feel like EPA misled the American people on Utility Act, and deliberately so. And uh, <clears throat> Ms. Capps, forgive me for going 20 seconds over, but I recognize you for five minutes of questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for recognizing me. And I'm, I'm sure I don't need to restate my concerns about the Olson bill, which I um, referred to in my opening remarks. Um, I got that off my chest in the beginning, Mr. Chairman. So now I, I, think, I think I'm ready to ask a couple of questions. Uh, you know, this bill before us waives liability, and this is a quote, under any federal, state, or local environmental law or regulation, that's the end of the quote, for an entity complying with the DOE reliability order. That strikes me as um, very broad language. And Ms. Hoffman, I'll, I'll start with you. Do you have any idea of what specific laws and regulations are waived uh, by this kind of language? My apologies. It's a very good question, and I think it's the heart of some of the discussions that, that have been occurring, and such that this, it weighs, from my understanding, penalties from statutes that are in, in, the, um, in the Clean Air Act. But, it, but it, doesn't, it doesn't appear, or at least the question that we're trying to struggle with is with, ex, with respect to administrative compliance order. Right. Does it waive? any of those, those penalties involved in that. And I think that's a part of the discussion that is the intent is unsure. I see. Yeah, uh, it, it, would, it seems to me that because of its broadness that it's very hard to get to the, the kind of nitty gritty places where you really do have discussions between a variety of agencies. Uh, it seems to me this would include federal, state, and local requirements. It could be as broad as uh, controlling air pollution, controlling water pollution, protecting drinking water for safe disposal of waste or to protect endangered species. Um, I, I don't even think that would necessarily be the end of the list. Um, maybe I'll try this another way. Are you aware of any example of a conflict between compliance with a 202C order and a compliance with an environmental requirement other than an air pollution control requirement? I am not aware of any. How about you, uh, Ms. McCarthy? Are you aware of some examples of any conflicts under any of these laws? I do not believe that there is an inherent conflict between 202C and EPA uh, moving forward with, uh, with environmental regulations and compliance with those. No, I'm not aware of any that have happened, and I'm not aware that there is any need for that conflict to happen. So we have, as an example, a single a conflict which involved an air pollution limit and the response of this bill as a result or I guess of that one instance is to waive every requirement that could be considered quote environmental without even knowing what we're waiving necessarily in advance. Um, that is not in my opinion a narrowly tailored uh, approach. Um, I, I, again Ms. McCarthy does this make sense to, to you? Would, can you from your experience can you explain uh, anything uh, having to do with this? this. I, I would just explain, uh, the only thing I can tell you is I believe this bill was well intended to address reliability concerns. We share those concerns and we've made that very clear. But I do not believe that the Merrant case that is being cited actually was a result of any inherent conflict in the use of 202C. Um, I believe that, that there, it is actually a good example of how the agencies work together and with the state agency to address a reliability concern and to ensure that that facility operated to the extent that we could in compliance with environmental regulations. And in fact, the company could have, in, for the most part, did. 
it had one problem because it did not, according to the Virginia DEQ, follow the operating and maintenance procedures outlined in those administrative orders. So it was a very successful application of these laws. It had no inherent conflict. It didn't ask the generator to make decisions between maintaining their responsibilities under 202C and 113A, our administrative order in compliance with environmental regulations. So what we do have is a history of negotiations when potential conflicts are, are, are anticipated that there is a history within the regulators uh, uh, and EPA uh, to come together uh, and to work, uh, to iron things out, to go back and forth and to have a discussion. And that's what is not reflected in this language, in my opinion. Uh, I think we can do better the, than this legislation, and I hope the chairman will decide to work to address some of the serious concerns uh, that we have about this legislation uh, before scheduling a markup. And I would yield back my time. Thank you, Ms. Capps. At this time, I recognize uh, the gentleman from Nebraska, Mr. Terry, is not here. So uh, Ms. McMorris Rogers uh, was recognized for five minutes for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, I wanted to start by just having the committee put up that slide again because I noticed something else was missing. <laughs> the slide from the uh, President Obama's approach to energy independence. I didn't see hydropower listed. Mm. We've already heard it's the largest source of renewable energy, 8%, 7 to 8% right now. I'm even under the impression that Department of Energy has included it as uh, that they have a goal of dub doubling hydropower. So I, I guess I just want to ask the question, uh, what is the role between the, the Department of Energy and the White House as far as our energy goals moving forward? And, and where is hydropower? The Department of Energy closely coordinates with the White House. We have a very strong program in looking at R&D in the hydropower area. We have had a lot of activities looking at the technical potential of hydropower and consider it a strong part of our portfolio. It is The research is conducted under the Office of Electricity, uh, Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy. So am I, am I to conclude that President Obama doesn't see a role a future role for hydropower and that he's actually picking wind and solar over hydropower as a renewable source of energy? I'm sorry, say that again. Well, am I to conclude that President Obama doesn't see a role for hydropower moving forward and that he's picking wind and solar as the renewable sources moving forward? Hydropower is an important part of the administration. I guess I have to look at that's a campaign website and it's part of our portfolio at the Department of Energy and the research and the development that we are working on. Okay, so so we'll work keep working to get hydropower listed. Okay. Uh, we'll keep working on that. Uh, I wanted to move over to Commissioner Moeller because um, on the previous topic we're hearing uh, on Olson's bill. The testimony from EPA and DOE today is saying that they don't believe the legislation is necessary to address the potential conflict between Section 202C of the Federal Power Act and the environmental laws and regulations. So I'd like to ask, do you agree with e EPA and DOE that the legislation isn't necessary to address the conflict? Thank you, uh, Congresswoman. Uh, I'm speaking today in terms of m myself and my fellow commissioners that that everyone supports the concept behind this bill. Personally, I support the bill. I think it's been used, uh, this authority, very, uh, very rarely. Uh, but the fundamental conflict is there. Uh, if, if someone is, is being asked to run, they're being asked to choose between violating one law or the other. And I just don't think that's fair to put a generator in that position. Again, I think uh, it has been and hopefully uh, may never be used again. But having it as one of our tools in the toolbox for reliability, I think, is important. Uh, we are entering an unprecedented nature of transitioning our fuel supply in this country on the electricity side uh, away from coal. And uh, as that happens, there will be a variety of local impacts that will be profound. And hopefully we'll be working very hard over the next few years to minimize any impacts or disruptions from that. But just in case, when it's peak load, 
uh, when it's usually very hot and there's an air inversion zone and health and safety is tied to the ability of people to have their air conditioning running, uh, it might just mean that there are occasions where uh, ordering a generator to run to keep people alive is worth the trade-off temporarily of the provisions of the Clean Air Act. Uh, so I understand FERC held a technical conference last November to, to consider the potential reliability implications of EPA's power sector regulations. So I'd like to ask, do you believe EPA's new and forthcoming power sector regulations pose a threat to reliability due to the expected retirement and retrofitting of a significant portion of the nation's coal-fired generation fleet? Well, it has to do with timing and very localized impacts. Uh, you heard Administrator McCarthy talk about the fourth year and the fifth year, and that's a pretty complicated topic because there are different conditions on the fifth year. Uh, but we have to do a lot within the next five years to make sure that this transition uh, is workable. We're, we're trying to work on it uh, with, at FERC to try and develop a relationship with the EPA so we can advise them more formally on reliability impacts of the regulations. I'm concerned. I think you can look to what's going to happen in northern Ohio um, in, the, in the near future as to where this set of issues comes together uh, in a very uh, challenging way over the next three years. And I think we'll be talking a lot about that over the summer. Thank you. And I yield back. Thank you. At this time, I uh, recognize the gentleman from Michigan, uh, Mr. Dingle, for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, thank you. I commend you for this hearing. And I congratulate my colleagues on the committee for bringing this matter to the committee's attention. These questions for Patricia Hoffman. But before I do so, I'd like to quote from Oliver Twist uh, and Charles Dickinson. We have here a situation before us where it appears, and I quote now, the law is an ass. Having said these things, is uh, these questions to Patricia Hoffman, yes or no? Is the Department of Energy currently required to consult with an environmental ent entity such as EPA when issuing an emergency order under Section 202C, yes or no? We are not required. We do consult with EPA as our past experience just, just, with the mayor. Yes or no, please. Yes or no. No, we are not required. Okay. An emergency order may be declared for other causes. Other causes is a broad term that could include any number of scenarios. Could an emergency order under H.R. 4273 effectively waive a utility for any reason from liability of ever complying with an environmental regulations such as the, merc such as the merc mercury or air toxic standards, yes or no? No, our order cannot waive thank, li thank liability. Uh, do you believe that there will be enough electricity generation for utilities to maintain their services to ratepayers while working to comply with EPA regulations, yes or no? I can't yes answer yes or no Department to that. That Energy, will be dependent on local. That yes. will be a very site regional specific question. Okay. Uh, would the Department of Energy want to make a comment on that? Okay. E would EPA want to make a comment on that? Uh, not at this time, no. Thank okay. you. Okay. So you're, you, you haven't got an answer to the question. Now, within the ISO region, there are nearly 10,000 megawatts from coal units that are already complying with the mercury and air toxic standards and the cross-state air pollution rule. Some utilities have said that stricter EPA regulations would create a reliability problem in the future due to the amount of time it takes to install technology to comply with these rules. Do you believe that utilities with coal units can comply with a new mercury rule within the three years stipulated by EPA or within four years if they receive an extra year from the local permitting authority? Please answer yes or no. This is to Gina McCarthy. Yes. All right. Now, uh, can you assure us that reliability will not be in jeopardy during this time period? Yes or no? I'll take it from both EPA and, and uh, uh, no, we, Department of Energy. No, we cannot assure that reliability. Thank will you. Be. Uh, the other agency, please. 
I can assure you that there is uh, systems in place that will make that happen, yes. Now, what outreach has EPA done to public utility commissions or public service commissions to talk about new uh, pending rules and regulations? Would you submit that for the record, please? Now, when working on a disaster type scenario, such as a hurricane, how quickly can EPA issue an administration, administrative consent order relating to any EPA related issues? Uh, it, it, it is case specific. We can issue them very quickly or we can have a more deliberate process. I'd like a, a written answer in which you be more specific on yes. that, if you please. Now, uh, these questions for Philip Moeller, Commissioner FERC. Mr. Moeller, to what extent can utilities plan for reliability uh, related emergencies that might fall under Section 202C? I believe as part of general reliability concerns, they, they spend an enormous amount of time um, planning for reliability contingencies would specific to that? 202C. I think it would be very plant specific based on how they'll have to comply with the EPA regulations over the next three to four to five years. Thank you. Would you please submit that for the record? Certainly. Uh, I, I, I want to get an understanding here of what happened and, and help me if you please. This is to all three agencies. Uh, is this statement factual? You have a situation here where uh, you are functioning under law. EPA issues one order, the D Department of Energy issues a different order, and we find, lo and behold, that the utility is caught in between. Uh, is there any, first of all, is there any relief to be given to the utility under existing law? Yes, uh, yes or no? I assume you're referring from fines and We're talking about this awful situation we have before us. Go ahead, Mr. Dingle, if you'd like me to. Uh, ju just a matter of correction. The, the instance that we're talking about on Merrant wasn't conflicting orders. The issue was that the, the company decided not to continue to run. EPA issued a 202 C. Then we worked with the company, DOE, and the state right, to no. issue an administrative order that allowed. Now, the two agencies, the two agencies, I think, and I apologize to you, Mr. Chairman, the two agencies behaved very well. But the state of Virginia finally ultimately fined them under its delegated responsibilities under the Clean Air Act. Is that right? They didn't fine them for complying with those orders. They fined them because they did not comply with the operation and maintenance requirements of those orders. Okay. Is there any relief that can be given to a utility under these circumstances? Do you have any agreements between the different agencies on giving relief or on coordinating your decisions? And, and, and can you tell me you don't need statutory authority on this? Please respond in writing. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Thank you. Gentlemen, time has expired. At this time, right now, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Olson, five minutes. I thank the chairman. And my first question is for Ms. McCarthy. Nice to see you again, ma'am. Thanks for coming today. You too, Mr. Olson. And I'm sure you agree on this, but in the event of a true emergency, DOE has the authority to compel power plants to operate to avoid a blackout under Section 202C, even if that means violating an environmental permit issued by EPA. And you've mentioned the Miron, situ Miron situation that happened in 2005 right across the river from here, about two miles from here. But you made no mention of another case that happened in 2005 with Miron in San Francisco, California. And in that case, I mean, I'll get into some details with the next panel about what happened out there, but the bottom line was Merritt was fined over seven figures, not some 30,000, seven figures, millions of dollars, because they were ordered by the regulator to keep the grid up and running, and because of that, they exceeded their permits under EPA, and the city of San Francisco sued them. And would you agree that blackouts could potentially create the greatest environment thre environmental threat and public safety hazard, like uncontrolled sewage, heat stroke, and controlled industrial, uncontrolled industrial processes, as my, I mentioned in my opening statement, a seven-month-old infant died this past week in Sugarland, Texas. He was in a car, 90-degree heat, for a couple of hours. And that's, that was the parents made a terrible mistake. But if our state has another drought and heat wave like they had this past summer, 100 degrees every day in Houston, Texas, unprecedented, the hottest August on record, 
If that happens again and the power goes out, infants all across Southeast Texas and elderly people all across Southeast Texas, their lives will be at risk. And would you agree that, I mean, again, blackouts could create, potentially create the greatest environmental threat, public, public safety hazards? Yes or no? Losing power in my state, the biggest threat, as opposed to something rolling on behind and finding Miron for the things they did to keep the power up. I, I would agree that reliability has primacy concern here, yes. Okay, thank you for that. And the, another question for Mr. Mueller, and thank you for coming today, sir, as well. You've been critical of EPA's power sector rulemaking and its effect on grid reliability. Has EPA adequately addressed your concerns that you raised in your testimony here uh, before this subcommittee last September with regard to the implementation timeline? Well, Congressman, uh, my main concern has been about the timing of the regulations. I'm not an epidemiologist, so I haven't gotten into the actual regulations themselves. But uh, the concern is over the fourth year and the fifth year of compliance and whether that's enough. And the fifth year is particularly challenging because uh, it requires a generator to agree to certain things uh, that can make it uh, quite vulnerable, again, perhaps, to citizen or other lawsuits. So it's, it's really about the timing and the focus on local reliability needs that are very load pocket specific in this country. And I can give you examples of those. Uh, we are working with the, uh, the EPA to try and come up with a more formal arrangement so that we can advise them. We have not come to resolution yet, but uh, that's because it's still sitting within the commission. But to me, it's about timing and uh, the concern about the fourth and the fifth year and very local uh, reliability impacts. Well, it sounds like you believe that there will be reliability emergencies in localized areas if EPA, EPA's rules are implemented as planned without flexibility. I'm not sure about emergencies, but I think we can anticipate severe challenges to change out fuel supply, add transmission, build new power plants in a very short amount of time. Yes or no answer. This, and my legislation will fix this problem. Yes or no. I support your legislation. Thank you. And Mrs. Hoffman, my last round is a question for you. Uh, for you. Um, you know, I asked your boss, Secretary Chu, uh, whether he was supportive of efforts to remedy the potential conflict between federal laws, and this is what he said in a hearing last month. I'm very supportive. We don't want to order a generator to continue to be online to supply emergency backup power and face federal fines from another branch. We are very eager to work through, the, through those issues. Are you aware of that statement by Secretary Chu? Yes, sir, I am. And you've publicly expressed your concerns that there is no neutral body conducting a very specific plant-by-plant -plant reliability anal analysis. And I believe there's overwhelming acknowledgement from your department, from FERC, from EPA, and others that without some flexibility, there will be reliability issues. I'd like to talk a little bit about the time I've got here about private generators. No, not about private generators, but about the public and municipality generators. Um, does DOE's jurisdiction extend to public or municipality-owned power? I do not believe, um, we, I will check that for the record, but I do not believe the jurisdiction is over municipalities. Yeah, and I've got, I've got a conflict here. My staff has told me that DOE's regs say yes, oh. they are, you do have jurisdiction I'm, over them, but sorry, the DOE then. staff I, says no. Yes, it is. I'm sorry. Okay, I, there you go. Just <laughs> my staff said the difference between DOE's, DOE's regs and DOE's staff. But the courts haven't ruled on this. Uh, the amendments to the Energy Policy Act of 2005 exempt rural electric co-ops and municipality-owned power from Part 2 of the Federal Power Act, which includes Section 202C. So would they have to voluntarily comply? They would have to voluntarily comply, correct, right now? Okay. Is my understanding, yes, they would. Okay. I guess I'm out of time. I'm getting the gavel there. You back to balance my time. Thank you. <clears throat> this time, I recognize the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Doyle, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, let's let's see here. Since 1978, there's been six times that DOE has issued a 202 order, and four of those times involved transmission lines. Only twice, generators. Right. So only two times since 1978 has this been ordered to a generator to, to provide power to the grid. In both those instances, in the 2001 case in California, the company Merritt was subject to a citizen lawsuit by the city of San Francisco 
and environmental groups for exceedance of the 877 hour operating limit and was forced to settle the lawsuit at significant expense. And in 2005, during its operation as directed by DOE, the Potomac River plant was forced to exceed its three hour NAX limit on February 23rd of 2007 and the Virginia DEQ issued a notice of violation and subsequently fined Merritt for NAX exceedances that were a result of Merritt's compliance with the DOE order to run for reliability. I want to ask a couple questions uh, to Ms. Hoffman. Ms. Hoffman, do you believe if this bill becomes law that the DOE will be inclined to offer more 202 orders? Uh, will there be some incentive here for you to use this 202 section more often than you currently use it? We, we do have a concern that there may be an incentive, but from experience that has uh, been demonstrated from the Mir and Power Plant example, the process that's been in place is that the, the, the order has to cons take in consideration NEPA and environmental considerations. And we have been working very closely with EPA. But uh, I'm asking you as DOE, you issue the order, right? Yes. Are you somehow incentivized? Do you think the oh, DOE? DOE? No. Yeah, no, I'm asking I'm are, sorry, are you going to be incentivized to issue more 202 orders as a result of this no, bill? No, sir. Okay, that's the point I want to make. So twice in, in 30 some years, uh, you've asked the generator to, to come online, and there's nothing in this bill that's going to incentivize the DOE to use this section more often than you currently use it. No, sir. Okay, thank you. Uh, also, I want to talk about the 2005 order. Now, we know EPA has, has no authority uh, in 202, but you routinely work in the two instances that this has ever happened uh, with the EPA to, to minimize environmental risk. In 2005, Section 202 was used by Secretary Bodman in the Bush administration. And did this order include any environmental requirements? Uh, yes, it did. So th there's a history in, in the rare instances that this is used that even though you're not required to by statute, you do work with EPA cooperatively to minimize environmental risk. Yes, sir. Thank you. Let me ask you uh, uh, another thing. I want to get to this thing about how this somehow incentivizes power companies to not comply with the five-year rule. I mean, there seems to be the implication here that, that certain power companies will, will be incentivized not to comply with the MATS, MATS rule and make their necessary upgrades over this five-year period, what, in the hopes that they get a 202 order? Uh, I mean, think about how far-fetched that is, that, that, you know, as someone who supports the MATS rule, uh, and a lot of what EPA is doing, which are, what is trying to be suggested here, is that these power companies will say, well, gee, we don't have to comply with this, this, you know, this five-year period to upgrade our facilities. We'll just hang out here and hope DOE gives us a 202 order. I mean, come on. Let's, let's not make statements that are implications that just defy all logic. As a member who sits up on this committee and defends the EPA and what you're trying to do with these standards, to say to this committee that somehow power companies are going to use this as some sort of incentive to not make these upgrades, look, they have to make the upgrades even if there's a 202 rule. Is that, is that correct? They still got to make the upgrades, right? Yes, sir. So if a power plant wants to operate under the laws we're passing right now, they're going to have to comply with this five-year period to make these upgrades. How, how are they skirting this? They're, I, I mean, what's the chances of a company that says we're not going to make these upgrades because we might get a 202 order. What's the chances they're going to get a 202 order? Twice in 38 years? I understand the concerns that you have, and, and I share those concerns, but it seems to me that there's got to be a practical way to say to generators in these ultra-rare instances that this occurs twice in 30-some years, uh, that they're not put in a situation where they have to pick which law to, to violate. That's all we're trying to do very narrowly with this bill. If the EPA or the DOE has some constructive language that they want to talk to us about before markup, 
I'm receptive to hearing about it. But the implication that somehow power companies are going to use this to skirt the law, I think, is far-fetched and, and a stretch. And the idea that somehow the public health is being endangered because twice in 38 years uh, this order was, was given, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Doyle. At this time, I recognize the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Griffith, for five minutes. Mm -hmm. First, let me ask, do you believe, thank you, Mr. Chairman, do you believe that, uh, that we're going to have more problems and, and more 202 orders issued uh, as opposed to twice in 30 years because of the policies of the EPA? Ms. Hoffman? I, I believe there is a potential for some emergency conditions to exist, but there are, if the plant operators truly be transparent, and follow the procedures, then I think we can minimize any of those cases. But because of the power plants that are run by coal that we've already seen that are shutting down, et cetera, is the reason that you made those statements and that you think there are going to be more 202 orders is because of some of the policies that are being brought about by the EPA in this, under this administration? I think there's a lot of things occurring in the United States right now. We're trying to build transmission. We have an increased direction on natural gas, the building right. of natural gas. And I wish lines. I had all of those have to be taken into and, consideration. And I wish I had more time. And of course, we don't have the natural gas lines to going to all the power plants that may close down. And so a lot of these power plants can't retrofit. That is also correct. Is it not? Yes or no? And so part of your concern is the same concern that we heard from uh, Mr. Moeller earlier is that, you know, we're just not sure it's all going to get done even in the best case scenario. It's all going to get done in time that we're not going to have some situations where we have energy emergencies like Mr. Olson was talking about because of the policies and the timelines put together by the administration's EPA. Isn't that your, in, in, in the end, isn't that what you're saying, yes or no? But there's going to be some slippage because of some of these policies. There are concerns of potential impact. Okay, I'm going to take that as a yes, and I've got to move on. Let me switch gears. Um, Mr. Moeller, if I might, I, I, and you may have to get me answers later because I'm asking you about a bill that's not technically before us, but it does deal with hydropower, and, and I'll address it generally to both you and, and Mr. Wright. Does FERC currently require private property rights to be considered when issuing a license under the Federal Power Act? And what about when the Commission is reviewing shoreline management plan, the shoreline management plans? Now, let me give you some background so you understand. I represent the 9th District. My colleague, Robert Hurt, represents the 5th District of Virginia. He has Smith Mountain Lake. I have Claytor Lake. We have huge shoreline management issue. Uh, situations and there's a feeling by the folks there that the private property owners along the shores and in the case of at least Smith Mountain Lake because I used to do title work uh, in that area some of the owners actually own the underlying land and AEP has the right to flood and there are concerns about that so the question is because Mr. Hurd has a bill in to make it clear but does does FERC currently require private property rights to be considered when issuing a license Congressman, uh, we've spent a lot of time on Smith Mountain Lake, but Jeff, uh, Mr. Wright is much closer to it than I am on a daily basis. I think we'll probably want to get back to you in writing, but I'll... I'll and that's fine, yeah. because I, you, you should not have expected these questions today, and I appreciate that. But if you could get back to me, because my big concern is, is that if we don't take these things into consideration, some of the folks there are worried that their, you know, their docks and maybe even, you know, boathouses may be impacted, and even though there may be the authority there, do we not have then a taking if the shoreline management plan does not take into consideration a taking for which either uh, the government or, uh, well, I guess it would be the government, would be responsible for re then reimbursing the, these folks for the damage to their property, not only the damage of the taking of that particular uh, dock or boathouse, but also the, the obvious then diminution in value of their property rights. So if you all could think about that and get some answers back to me, I would greatly appreciate it. Um, and I would ask also if you all believe that uh, private property is in fact a local economic interest, which would be covered, I think, under some of the current language. Uh, private property rights are, are a very significant part of 
uh, whenever we do a relicensing on shoreline management plans and the, as the, related to titles, they get very complicated. But uh, I think we try to do our best to, to, to manage the various uses of a project that, of course, respects private property rights. And I appreciate that. Last but not least, uh, I think the bill we have before us is, is a good step on small hydro uh, power generation, which is interesting. It's not in the, uh, in the plan along with coal. Uh, you know, it's kind of interesting. I've got coal and I've got hydro, and both of them are not considered all of the above by the administration. Um, what, uh, can you tell me what are the biggest barriers to greater hydro power development in the United States? Either one of you can take it. Yeah. Um, right now, I think one of the biggest barriers to licensing are probably the mandatory conditions we have from other state, federal, tribal. Um, we're compelled under the Federal Power Act to include mandatory conditions um, from the land management agencies, Fish and Wildlife Service, National Marine Fishery Service. Um, we have to wait on Clean Water Act um, permits that are delegated to state governments. Um, even exemptions, the conduit exemptions, the five megawatt exemptions are subject to mandatory conditions from state and federal fish and wildlife agencies. Thank you very much. And regrettably, my time is up, Mr. Chairman. If you want to give Mr. Moeller time to respond, I'm happy with that, but my time is up. Your time, your time is up. I yield back. Thank you. <laughs> the, uh, Mr. Moeller have other opportunities mm -hmm. with other questions. Um, Mr. McKinley, Mr. Colash is recognized for uh, five minutes. Uh, I am curious, uh, uh, back uh, when um, former Chairman Dingle raised a question back to both of you, uh, I, I want to make sure I heard it right because my hearing impairment did. Did he say to you, Ms. Huffman, can you assure us of reliability or, did, or, or that it would not be a blackout or brownout? How, did, how was that worded again? Could you share with me how that question came? And you said, no, you could not assure. But Gina, you said, Ms. McCarthy, she, you said yes, you could. So what was we the question? We could not absolutely assure that we could not prevent. Here. Yes, I yielded. And I, I thank the gentleman for his courtesy. Can you assure us that reliability will not be in jeopardy during this time period? Please answer okay. yes or no. Okay, thank and you. And I thank the gentleman. So having, uh, there was a yes, or there was a no, and a yes. So, Mr. Moeller, do you, do you agree with the EPA that they can give us that assurance? Well, I never make any assurances on reliability, uh, so no, no. Between the two of them, you heard her just testify that she could. Well, so I don't want to My question to you from your position, uh, you're not, uh, not, Ms. McCarthy, I'll get back to you. Okay. So, Mr. Moeller? We're working hard to make sure that we have a process with the EPA that deals with the timing issues. We haven't resolved that yet. It's of great concern to me that we have the proper process that, that allows our reliability experts to weigh in on the individual load pocket situations where a major plant or maybe even a minor plant is shut down, but because of where it is in the grid, it's necessary, perhaps, to maintain voltage support for that. So, part you're, of the grid. Uh, if I so, could take from the, the so, excuse former me, chairman, the answer is a yes or no. Do you sorry. agree? Do you agree that she could make that statement? Uh, that she can assure us. Kenley, I did not make that statement. You did not. I did not. I I'm sorry. I, I misunderstood. I thought you said yes. You could. Place to address those issues. I'm sorry. I, I assured the gentleman. Could that you there speak were a little closer to your mic? You. Oh, sorry. Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I, I did not make assurances, and EPA is not in the reliability business, and I understand that. Well, what that's I for sure. What I said was yeah, that, that uh, there are processes in place to address reliability concerns as they arise. Okay, I just thought your answer back to Chairman Dingle was uh, uh, was yes. I think I made it very clear that I assured him that there were processes in place to address issues related okay. to reliability. Uh, now, at the last time, Ms. McCarthy, you were here, you, you um, there was a discussion between you and the DOE, and, and it was uh, about some of the, the new regs that were out, and especially 
uh, with the discharge, and you seemed taken back by the fact that the DOE had just reduced spending. You were saying how we carbon capture and the like, but DOE had just cut the funding for research on that. Have you found out, have you done, have you raised the question about why did they cut back on, on carbon capture? Uh, I'm sorry, I, 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 don't, I do recollect that issue coming up, and I know it was related to the greenhouse gas new source performance standard, but I, I do not uh, have any further information at this point to share with you. I, I hesitate, with all due respect, I hesitate to ask you to eventually get back to us, because I'm still waiting since last January for information from your office. Uh, but if you could, please, I, I'd like to understand your position. If you're, if you're pushing for carbon capture, but yet DOE is cutting funding in, in research. Um, I, I think it's, it's, a, it's a contradiction here. Uh, the, the, the left hand doesn't know what the right hand's doing and something that affects us on energy policy. Congressman, if there is something that we owe you at, at any length in time in terms of response, I, I will take care of that immediately. But I, but I will say that the rule that, that you're referencing is based on technologies that we believe are, is available today. Yeah. And that was one of the questions we asked. Yes. Show me where one plant that has that commercially available. When MIT is doing the MIT's carbon capture initiative right now is underway to to try to to try to get to a point. But you're representing that it's a commercially. You said that you, it was commercially available, and we asked, name one plant in America that has a facility like this. And you said you get back to us. I I'm, apologize. We'll pardon me. I'm still waiting. Right Can you name one now? I'm terrible with names. They all sound so nice when you name <laughs> utilities. Um, uh, <laughs> no, I didn't say uh, that. We're over. So you, 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 Gentlemen's you time beat, expired. You beat the bell. And there, we'll there talk again. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Chair, recognize the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Walden, for five minutes. Thank the gentleman. Uh, I know when the president was running for office, President Obama said that you know his his idea on coal was to end up with. Uh, Would the gentleman uh, yield? Yeah. I I I didn't see my colleague from uh, the neighboring state here, so you recognize Mr. Sarbanes for five minutes. Uh, I would uh, yield back and start over at a later date. Yeah. <laughs> you needed to rework your statement anyway. You were humming around, so. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. Um, I'm I'm still getting my head around the issues here, but I certainly understand why um, a power plant or a company that is um, exercising its best efforts to try to make transitions and uh, take steps to meet environmental standards, if something occurs that uh, forces them to exceed to a uh, a reliability um, requirement, and therefore they are put into conflict with some of these standards that they would, under those circumstances, expect to get some protection from liability and other exposure because they are exercising all the best efforts and doing the things that we want them to do. But I can also see situations where there be um, an incentive to drag one's feet, potentially, and this could be done consciously or unconsciously perhaps, thereby creating a, a situation where um, a crisis would occur in terms of reliability if you, if you weren't able to continue on. And um, that's the dynamic, the tension here that we're looking at because we want to we want to offer some protection where you're genuinely put in this position of having to continue on and, and maybe violate some standards at the same time. We don't want people to be able to game the system uh, in some ways. And I'd appreciate it, Ms. McCarthy, if you maybe could speak a little bit more to the, any concerns you might have about that or, or uh, examples we've seen where that kind of thing has occurred and, and could occur in the future if there was a real broad blanket um, uh, exemption or liability protection put in place. Uh, 
Thank you, Congressman. Um, I, I would say that I don't disagree with, with the stated goals uh, a, as you articulated them. All I will say is I don't believe that there is any inherent conflict that warrants Congress to be concerned at this point. And there's no conflict in the application of the laws and the regulations as we have managed them uh, under, the, under these laws. And I would say that in one instance, you had a company that was uh, provided a 202C uh, order as well as a 113A order. The combination of those were to provide a sure pathway to address reliability in a clear pathway to stay in compliance with environmental regulations. It was very successfully done. The company failed, according to the Virginia DEQ, to actually comply with those effectively, and they were fined a minimal amount. We are dealing with a company that had compliance problems before, a company that continues to have compliance problems. I'm sorry, not a company, a facility. The current owner was just fined in February almost $300,000 for six violations of pollution standards. So it, is, it was not unusual. It is unfortunate that they didn't fully comply, but I don't think we'd be sitting here now had they, and I don't think that warrants congressional action. Now, in terms of the problem with, with what, what might this signal be, is we, we all agree that the DOE 202C uh, order is a last resort. Our only concern is that that last resort be tur not turned into a path of least resistance because right now we have great activity in energy among our, our energy colleagues in terms of planning for compliance under MATS, making sure that they address any reliability issues, working with the three agencies that you see represented here. I just don't want this to change that dynamic and to make them understand that a 202C order could be available to them with no planning, with no advanced action, with no working with their environmental regulators or energy regulators, and provide them an opportunity to do nothing in the interim and then to cause a reliability problem as a result. Well, I think it's a fair concern, and we just need to be careful that the fix that we're attempting to uh, uh, design here is not overbroad with respect to the original problem that's been that's been raised. Congressman, can I make one correction that you made? Yeah. Uh, uh, just for, for Mr. Olson, the Petrero utility incident was not related to 202C3, 202C. It was not a 202C issue, which is why we believe that the Mirant issue is the only one that's relevant here, and in fact that isn't a, a problem in and of itself. Thank you. I yield back. Gentleman's time expired. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Oregon now. You sure about Walden. that? Yeah, thank I'm you. not sure, but we're going to try. All right. I thank the gentleman, uh, the Chairman. Look, the families of America are, uh, are really struggling with cost of energy, whether it's trying to fuel up their vehicles so they can go to the grocery store or take their kids to school or to after school activities. Um, this is the Obama administration is one that I think has a horribly misguided energy policy. It is not all of the above. That was actually something Republicans talked about for a long time. Our only failure was we didn't trademark that uh, saying in time. But the president is uh, on his website, and I assume he doesn't disown his own website since it's his website. Now, it talks about all our energy resources and then leaves out 57 percent of the electricity side of energy. No coal, no hydro is listed here. That's about 57 percent or more of America's energy. Uh, he seems to think the future of energy is uh, Solyndra. To quote, the true en engine of economic growth for our country will always be companies like Solyndra. The future is here at Solyndra. We're poised to transform the way we use power, the way we power our homes, our cars, and our businesses. This is part of why a lot of Americans who are actually paying the bills and living in the real world in the middle class are concerned about the direction of this president and this administration and his failed economic policies that have left us in a horrible situation with the smallest workforce since 1981. Those of us with kids who are about to graduate from college are figuring out where they're going to live on the height of bed in the basement uh, because they're moving back home. And it's a real problem. And, and then you go back to his comments in, I believe it was San Francisco, 
uh, when he was running for office where he said, let me sort of describe my overall policy. What I have said is that we would put a cap and trade system in place that is as aggressive, if not more aggressive, than anybody else is out there. I, this is President Obama running. I was the first to call for 100 percent auction of the cap and trade system, which means that every unit of carbon or greenhouse gas as emitted would be charged to the polluter. That will create a market in which whatever technologies are out there that are being presented, whatever power plants that are being built, that they would have to meet the rigors of that market and the ratcheted down caps that are being placed, imposed every year. So if somebody wants to build a coal-powered plant, they can. It is just that it will bankrupt them because they are going to be charged a huge sum for all that greenhouse gas that is being emitted. That, this is the President Obama again. That will also generate billions of dollars that we can invest in solar, wind, biodiesel, and other alternative energy approaches. The only thing I have said with respect to coal, I haven't been some coal booster. What I have said is that for us to take coal off the table at a, and this is, as he said, an ideological matter as opposed to saying if technology allows us to use coal in a clean way, we should pursue it. So if somebody wants to build a coal power plant, they can. It is just that it will bankrupt them. Close quote. Barack Obama running for office. Now, we know uh, by his own website he doesn't think coal or hydro are part of an all of the above energy strategy coming from the Pacific Northwest. We actually think hydro is pretty important. Um, and actually a lot of our coal, our electricity comes from coal. Uh, we also have wind. We are now trying to figure out how to integrate wind into the grid and into a hydro grid. Uh, it is a very difficult process. In some parts of the country, we now have negative energy pricing, where we are paying energy providers not to produce energy at certain times because we have a surplus. Taxpayers and ratepayers begin to wonder about that policy. Uh, we have a great record in the Northwest on saving energy through conservation. Very proud of that. Uh, I, I drive a hybrid on both coasts. Uh, I try and do my part. I can and I do. Uh, but this administration policies are taking this country off the edge and driving up energy prices. Uh, the Keystone Pipeline, another example where we could be working with our partners across the border in Canada, not only to create American jobs, but to use North American energy and bring it here and refine it here and create jobs. And the President stands in the way of that, President Obama. And so it is, uh, I am just going to uh, tell those of you in the agencies, I mean, uh, Ms. Hoffman, you said earlier that you coordinate, the Department of Energy coordinates closely with the White House on energy issues. I assume that means you also coordinate closely with the White House on energy issues like Solyndra. You must have. Um, and we have other committees looking into that and, and trying to figure out just how closely all that got coordinated. But at the end of the day, some of us actually believe in an all the above energy policy. We are deeply concerned that EPA has the lowest number uh, uh, predicting in terms of gigawatts that are going to come off. The, uh, the, the, the grid as a result of uh, the Obama administration's policies. I think my colleague here is going to talk about that a little bit. Um, we we got uh, to have a different direction. Part of us are concerned about the grid and its reliability because the policies coming from this administration. Are my time expired. I thank the gentleman for his questions. Uh, chair now yields to uh, Mr. Mr. Waxman for uh, 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 thank you. with the ranking member. Uh, Chairman Upton, uh, before I got here, said that he would give you five minutes for an opening statement and then a round of, of questions. I was very gracious of him, Mr. Chairman, and what I'd prefer to do is to have my opening statement make part of the record and would proceed now for five minutes. That we would greatly appreciate that, without objection, so ordered. And, Thank you. and the, the rank member is recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much. Section 202C of the Federal Power Act gives the Secretary of Energy the authority to order a utility to generate or transmit electricity in an emergency situation. This authority is really a last resort. Only a handful of orders have been issued over the years. There has only been uh, uh, at most one case where a DOE order required actions that led to noncompliance with environmental requirements. And even in that case, it is not clear that noncompliance was necessary. One reason we rarely face this conflict is that potential issues are worked out with the regional grid operators and environmental regulators. If that is insufficient, both DOE and EPA are involved in addressing potential conflicts. With enforceable environmental requirements in place, operators have a strong incentive to minimize the extent of any noncompliance with such requirements. 
But this bill would change all that. It would allow DOE to waive liability for all environmental violations, eliminating the current incentives for operators to minimize noncompliance. The bill also removes EPA's important role in the process. Uh, Ms. Hoffman, does DOE have the expertise to determine the appropriate environmental safeguards that should apply to a generation plant order to run under a 202C order? DOE has the capability to, <coughs> excuse me, do NEPA assessments and NEPA follow the requirements under the National Environmental Policy Act. What, what DO, DOE relies on EPA and the environmental organizations is to look at is there a need to develop an administrative compliance order. So you would, cons you, you could in consult with EPA? Yes, sir. Uh, we if, do, and we If have. you choose, even if you do choose to consult with EPA, Nothing in this bill requires that, nor does this bill require you to incorporate any of their suggestions. Right now, if a utility wants protection from liability for noncompliance with an environmental requirement, they must go to EPA and obtain an administrative order or enter into a consent decree. Ms. McCarthy, how would EPA handle a request from a company concerned that compliance with a 202C order would violate a clean air requirement? We actually enter into a discussion with that company. We enter into a discussion with the state and the local community, and we make sure that we design any relief in a way that mitigates any environmental concerns and, to the extent possible, uh, complies with environmental laws and regulations. Is this a process, process that can be completed quickly if necessary? It is. Uh, that process gives everyone the assurance that the company is doing its best to minimize the extent of environmental harm but this bill would simply waive all environmental requirements for companies operating under a 202C order. Ms. McCarthy, with a free pass from all environmental requirements, would a company have any incentive to talk to EPA? Uh, not that I'm aware of. In the example cited by Jen On, uh, the company was operating under an administrative order. It was not at risk of EPA enforcement. Ms. McCarthy, if this bill were limited to situations where an EPA administrative order or consent decree were in place, would that ameliorate some of your concerns about the effects of this bill? Some of the concerns would indeed be, be ameliorated by such a change. If we were trying to balance reliability needs and environmental protections, I just think it makes sense to cut environmental regulators. I just think it doesn't make sense to cut environmental regulators out of the process. I think what we have here are legitimate concerns. We ought to look at them carefully, balance them, uh, so that uh, we don't uh, go too far. And with that, I, I want to work with my colleagues on this uh, subcommittee to see if we can achieve those goals. Yield back my time. Chairman, uh, <laughs> Ranking Member yields back his time. Chair now recognizes uh, Chairman Emeritus, Mr. Barton, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing and the series of continuing hearings on our nation's energy policy. Um, my first question is just to ask each of the senior officials whether their agencies support or oppose these two bills. Uh, Ms. Hoffman, does the Department of Energy support both bills, oppose both bills, undecided? What's, we what, don't have a position at this time on both on, bills. On either. You, you're on either neutral. Bill. What about you, uh, Ms. McCarthy? What's the EPA's position? Uh, the administration doesn't have an official position, nor does EPA. So you all are neutral also? Uh, we, we have raised concerns with the bill, but we but are not in an official position at neutral. this point. What about the FERC, um, Mr. Chairman? Uh, I was allowed to speak for my colleagues to say that the four of us support the concept be behind uh, 4273, and I, I'll let Mr. Wright uh, address the well, I, I just I just want to kind of get a baseline of where the age, the administration is, and uh, apparently the administration is neutral, according to the Department of Energy rep, the Department of EPA, or the agency of EPA and the uh, the commission. Um, I think it's a true statement. Um, what um, Ms. McCarthy said in her written testimony, and what Mr. Waxman just alluded to that there haven't been many cases in the past where 
where we had to invoke this um, <clears throat> section 202 c um, and I think that's primarily for two reasons number one uh, we've tended to have fairly substantial reserve margins so there's there's never really been an operating uh, emergency or not very frequently and number two until very recently um, most of the electricity generated in the United States was generated uh, under state regulatory under state issues where they have a regulated power market they don't have an open market uh, like we have now in Texas where where it's it's basically a merchant power market but um, as the EPA continues to issue more and more stringent environmental regulations um, those reserve margins are going down uh, and as more and more states open up their markets to competition uh, the economic consequence of that is always that you take the older, less efficient plants uh, out of operation so you don't, and you're not able to keep a reserve margin uh, in what used to be called the rate base. So I think, it's, I think it is timely that these two bills, especially the, um, the first bill, H.R. 4273, have been put into play because in the future uh, I think you're going to see situations. Uh, where reserve margins are not adequate and where you're going to have potential for blackouts. I've been told uh, by several uh, authorities, both in the private sector and the public sector in Texas, that we're going to have rolling blackouts this summer if, uh, if we have heat like we had last summer. Uh, and last summer there were deaths uh, in Dallas, Texas from the heat when uh, uh, some of our less robust populations, air conditioners were stolen uh, and um, uh, the people couldn't, didn't have the mobility nor the ability to call for help uh, and, and they suffered uh, uh, the fatal consequences. So Ms. McCarthy, in your written testimony you speak that about a concern, to use your term, <laughs> that if um, if H.R. 4273 were to become law, that it could have a possible negative health consequence. Do you not agree that uh, uh, if you have a blackout for any extended period of time in an area that's having a high heat situation, that that is, is, is a higher uh, potential for health than uh, giving some sort of emergency operation to, a, to an older power plant that might violate for a small amount of time some very stringent environmental law? I would absolutely agree that maintaining electricity reliability is critical, but that's why we've been working so closely with the regional transmission organizations, planning entities, including ERCOT. Uh, to try to understand the concerns and, and to address them in a way that maintains flexibility, that maintains reliability, and that is cost effective. And, and we believe we're working on those issues and very effectively. Well, I appreciate that. And my time's about to expire. I, I do want to say, Mr. Chairman, I strongly support both of these bills. Um, you know, obviously, they're subject to tweaking and being um, improved. But I think the concept in both bills is, is, is noble, and I hope that the uh, subcommittee moves them, the full committee moves them, and that we can work with our friends in the Senate to, in the, on the House floor to get these on the President's day. I see no downside to either of these bills, and I see a huge positive upside. The uh, ranking member, I mean, uh, Chairman Emeritus yields back his time. The chair now recognizes himself for five minutes. Thank you all for being here. Um, you know, there was a Christian book uh, published years ago uh, called Evidence That Demands a Verdict. And it was uh, laying out the facts, historical accuracies, and just makes a claim that people need to make a decision. Uh, the evidence of this administration's attack on, on coal is clear. I mean, it, it, we, we talked about it last time you were here, Ms. McCarthy, about all the five rules and regs, uh, Merck, uh, Boiler Mac, cooling towers, shutting down plants now. Greenhouse gas had just come out a uh, day or two before. No new coal-fired power plants. We have uh, the President's statement that I played last hearing about his, what, he desi what his desire was to do as President of the United States for coal. 
Now we have Obama II, the second term, no coal in his all the above energy. It is clear, the evidence is clear, that this administration has a deep-seated hatred for coal and electricity generated by that coal. Um, and, of course, we don't even talk about the, the Region five, 5 Administrator and his crucifixion statement. So we just can't go that way. I mean, you, you, you just can't keep coming here and say, yeah, we really do like coal. Everything's going to be okay. Because the evidence outweighs any public statements of, no, we really, we really do like it. We, it. Everything will be okay. We had a great hearing last year on reliability, and I want to put the, the bar chart up. Mr. Walden sort of mentioned it. And, and the bar chart is an analysis of EPA rules and regs and what the effect is, is gonna, on uh, electricity generation around this country. And the smallest little bitty bar, the 10 gigawatts, that's the EPA's analysis. Everything else is the closest one, well, there's one close to that, the, uh, oh, Citibank is uh, 15, but everything else is 25, EEI is 75. Um, so this isn't a debate really, but I, Chairman Emeritus Barton was right. When you have an oversupply of electricity, one, you have low prices, but it mitigates this problem. When supply is going to be constrained based upon these rules, we're going to see this happening a lot. So this is one of the few times we're trying to get ahead of the curve, not talk about problems of the past. Even if, even if EPA is right and it's only 10 gigawatts, that's a lot of, that's a lot of base load offline because of, of regulations. Now, in that hearing, as I recall, DOE agreed with EPA. And my question to you, Ms. Hoffman, was uh, who did that analysis under, under the DOE? Uh, the DOE study that was done was by Policy and International in the Department of Energy. A policy. The policy sector. Don't you have an electricity sector uh, group? Yes. Why would, why would you have the policy folks do the analysis and not the experts in DOE on electricity? The, the study was done because it was a coordination across multiple agencies and the policy sector took the lead on that study. Our because it's a policy position, not one based upon science? It was done based on mo modeling and analysis of information and data that was available. I think we're awaiting a response and writing on this question. Uh, I think it was asked to be responded by mid-April, um, and we have yet to see it. Uh, can you ensure that that gets to us to address this issue? I will, sir. Because the problem is this. I believe at least mid I, I believe 40, which is probably the medium of this, which is four times more the EPA, which gives us more four, time, four times more. So when we, maybe we only had two. Now we may have eight. And then what happens? Let me go to my time is rapidly moving by. Let me just ask Ms. McCarthy. Uh, what are some of the tools you have? Is it, let me go quicker than this. Is one tool a consent order? Yes. How quickly can, it, will, can a con consent order be activated? A consent order is not just action by, by EPA, but it also needs to go to the courts as well. So it is a more lengthy process than an administration. And how the 2005 case that we're, uh, how long did that take? Uh, the 2005 case, I believe, took six months for the agency to do an administrative order. So that's not really a timely response to fix a problem. Uh, it, it, we, uh, that was a situation that was, had no advanced warning. I don't want the, the committee to believe that that is like an emergency. in place under the administrative like an emergency. policy. Say it again? Like an emergency. That's when it, 
no well, advance it, it happened no advance notice that's why it's an emergency situation well, that is exactly why under that's the, why we can't wait six rule, months we established a, a policy okay, let me ask another question a clear pathway and an administrative consent order does it protect a company from citizen lawsuit liability in all cases it does not um, thank you uh, my time's expired I'll now uh, I'd like to recognize my colleague, Mr. Scalise, for five minutes. Thank the gentleman from Illinois, the chairman, for yielding and uh, for raising these questions. I think it's important as we, as we look at the, uh, the legislation at hand, and I'm a strong supporter of both pieces of legislation. I think uh, Mr. Olson and, uh, and Doyle and others brought a, a strong bipartisan uh, bill to address a, a serious problem that we've seen out there, especially as it relates to emergencies. I think from testimony today, it shows that while these are isolated, uh, that people that, that produce power for our country uh, are unfortunately posed with a dilemma in the event of an emergency. And, and we're here for that reason. Uh, and, and again, with a very strong bipartisan group of co-sponsors on the legislation, because I think there is the recognition uh, that if a, if a company's placed in this decision, uh, you want them to be able to act based on what's best for consumers while not being concerned that if they follow the order that they're given, they're going to be sued on the other side just for complying with the order. And so, uh, Ms. McCarthy, in your testimony, and this is I think, following up on Mr. Shimkus's comments, you say the EPA believes that the executive branch already has sufficient tools to address issues that may arise. And, and that was the reason you gave uh, for one of the reasons you gave for the, the, the lack of need for this legislation, but yet you just admitted in your testimony, in your answer to, to Mr. Shimkus, that uh, the tools that you have, even including a consent order, uh, do not prevent some outside lawsuit being brought forward. And so how can you say that the legislation is not necessary and you have the tools when, in fact, you don't maintain those tools uh, to prevent outside lawsuits that, that we're trying to prevent uh, just because somebody complied with, with an order? We have issued administrative orders last year alone 1,300. We are dealing with an instance here in which we have a tool that's very reliable, a tool that is well thought out. What tool are you talking the, about? The consent orders? Order. A consent order is used very effectively as well. But the administrative order, which is what's in question here, is, is for all practical purposes a, a significant protection for both the generator involved and a significant source of protection for the community in terms of reducing pollution as a result of the need to comply with reliability and address reliability concerns. So, so the consent order, the ability for you to, to issue those orders, uh, and I'll, I'll ask the question again, does that, does that ability that you have, that tool that you have, prevent a third party lawsuit from coming forward on the same issue? I know, I know. I'm Yeah. Okay. I, I, I'm sorry. You, you're using different terms. I just want to make sure I'm answering your question correctly. A consent order does go to the court and does does offer that protection. How long does that take? Administrative order it, does not directly. But okay, in a fact, consent order. Wait, when you say a consent order provides that protection, does the it, consent it, order prevent a third party lawsuit? No. That's the question. A consent decree does. An administrative order, for practical purpose, does. But it does. But it, it. But it legally, there is a risk of civil action. It is almost never happened, and at times. Well, we're talking about almost never, happened. but we're only talking about select emergencies, which, which is what this bill is, is specifically dealing with. And so, when you say there is that still that risk there, you know, on one hand, there you're is, saying you've got the tools in your tool animal, chest. It's impractical. But, but then you just is. acknowledge that there still is a risk, and what we're trying to do it, is remove that risk. That's what the bill is being for, brought forward to address, is to address the risk that you're acknowledging exists. I, I understand that. I, the only thing I think that we're disagreeing with is whether or not this tool, is the, the, the law is crafted effectively to address that issue while still minimizing the extent that pollution will be emitted and significantly protecting public health, which we believe the current system actually does. Well, let me ask you this question, because Commissioner Moeller earlier in his testimony uh, said that all four current four commissioners support the concept behind this legislation that we're discussing. Uh, 
so that generators are not in a position of having to choose whether to violate Section 202C of the Federal Power Act or whether to violate environmental regulations. So I guess how would you respond to, to his testimony that all four commissioners, including the chairman, support this I and would think that this is the, actually solving the problem? I would join in the chorus that reliability is essential to maintain and that generators shouldn't be put in a position of having to choose with compliance between two orders. The way, what I would suggest, however, is that they are not put in that position now. They never have been. And I don't anticipate that they will be as a result of any actions that even. But you did acknowledge that there is that risk that, that we're addressing. You know, and I guess that, that is, gets to the question. On one hand, you're saying you support the concept behind it. Maybe you, know, you have some differences in how it's drafted. But then in your testimony, you said EPA believes that the exec quote, EPA believes that the executive branch already has sufficient tools to address issues that may arise. Yet later, as we were talking, you acknowledge that there are risks still. Even with your tools, there are still risks. You there, know, so there is a legal risk. In practical terms, it has not happened. And we're, we're just making sure that not only in practical terms, but in legal terms, it doesn't happen by removing the risk. By removing risk, you, you actually give, give everybody the comfort that they can go and do what they I need to do to provide that. power without that sure risk. I understand that. that the cure is, is commensurate with what you're and that's, trying to And that's do. why I think you've got a, a broad bipartisan group of members that, that came together to, to make sure that cure is right. One final question I want to ask you before my time expires. Earlier in the year, uh, Mr. Terry, I believe it was, on our committee, had asked uh, Administrator Jackson, who was before our committee, uh, if, if EPA would start posting petitions on your website uh, so that we could see the petitions that are being brought forward. And, and Administrator Jackson acknowledged that, that, yes, she would start posting it, and in fact, that it was easy to do, and yet still to this day there, there are no postings. Can you tell us why months later uh, that still hasn't happened, and do you have any kind of time frame of when we'll start being able to get that public information out in a transparent manner so that people could see this on the website? I, I will make sure that I, I take your concern back, and we will respond to that right away. Good. Okay, M I appreciate Mr. that, Chairman. and I yield back the balance of my time. Mr. Mr. Yields Mr. Back Mr. Time. Chairman, can I? Well, for purposes of well, I, Morgan, I ask actually this uh, just to follow up. Is on Is there that. objection for uh, one minute Real for quickly. Mr. Walden? Without yeah. objection, to order, you're recognizing Because I asked the same question of uh, Administrator Jackson, and she committed that she would do that and make that change. And I have been busy on other telecom matters and all. And so I, I would share in what Mr. Scalise raised regarding Mr. Terry and would appreciate a, a response. I will make sure yeah, I Yeah, because she indicated that. it wouldn't be a problem, and you get right on it. So I'll bring that back. Thank, thank you. you. I thank my colleague, and Chair now recognizes uh, my colleague from Kansas, Mr. Pompeo, for five minutes. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I've been waiting 16 months to say, say this. I, I agree with Mr. Doyle. Um, <laughs> the, um, <clears throat> I, 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 uh, I, I read the, uh, the objections uh, uh, Ms. Hoffman and Ms. McCarthy have, and you, you're concerned that you'll create an incentive for power plants to sort of do nothing and hope that they'll get an order. <clears throat> doesn't hold much weight for me, much concern, and I think, I, think the, I think the likelihood of that happening is pretty low. Are there any other concerns that you all have beside that one that, that I didn't read them, but are there concerns besides that concern of, a, of a, a generator sort of gaming the system and hoping on hope that they get one of these orders uh, to, to keep them in the, in the clear? I, do, I don't have any other concerns. I think part of the process is making sure that we work diligently through the process in such that the, the executive order, the 202C order, is clear under the terms in which a reliability event is happening and how long in the duration of that event, as well as any administrative order is clear on the terms and conditions under which a power plant would operate. I appreciate that. Thank you. Ms. McCarthy, are there, is, is there other concern other than that, that risk? I, uh, the, the only other concern is that I believe it's extremely important for EPA and the states to be engaged in this decision and have a clear role to minimize pollution uh, when you're addressing a reliability problem. Great. Thank you. I appreciate that. Let me, uh, let me try and get, so I, I listened to the uh, colloquy between uh, Ms. McCarthy, you and, and Mr. Scalise, and you know, there have only been two, and we're concerned that this might happen, this, this disconnect. Uh, I, I'll, I'll, describe, I'll describe to you why I, I, I think folks are concerned about it, and it has to do with, I think, the increased likelihood uh, as these regulations come into place that we see this issue arise more and more. You and I back in February uh, talked about uh, Utility Act and whether suppliers had said, yeah, we can actually build this darn thing that's compliant. And I asked you uh, 
if you had a certification from suppliers that they could. I was hearing they couldn't get these plants financed because no supplier would come in and say, oh, we can, oh, we can actually do that in the real world. Um, you said that you, at that point, you said you had no written guarantees uh, from suppliers. Have you received any since then, since the time we spoke back in February? That they can build mats and utility mat uh, compliant facilities? We are actually looking, looking at that issue, and as you might guess, we've received petitions to, to look at that issue, so we will be addressing it. I appreciate that. I actually want to talk about one of the petitions that came, it came from uh, the Institute of Clean Air Companies. Uh, representing a lot of the folks who are going to be tasked with <laughs> actually doing this work. Uh, they're, they're very, very concerned that they, they can't build these plants, and, and they, this starts to get to this reliability risk that I think now exists more than it may have in the years that we talk about there being very few of these 202C orders required. I, I really appreciate the fact that, that, that this concern has been raised about new facilities. I just want to clarify that it, it is not a concern about the existing facilities continuing to operate. That, that's correct. Their, their petition relates to particularly mercury measurement, the capacity to measure mercury at an accurate and timely we, way. We will definitely be taking a look at that. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you. Uh, with that, I, I yield back the balance of my time, Mr. Chairman. The uh, gentleman yields back his time. The chair now recognizes the late coming Mr. Gardner, who is trying to get to his seat for uh, five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for recognizing me, and thank you to the witnesses. I won't take long with my questions this morning. Uh, to uh, Ms. McCarthy, thank you very much for, for being here. Uh, Tri-State is a wholesale electric power supplier in Colorado that is owned by the 44, uh, 44 cooperatives generating uh, transmitting electricity and has come to my office many multiple times uh, trying to talk about their compliance with EPA's utility max standards and whether it would likely cost Tri-State about $1 billion. That's their estimates that it would likely cost them $1 million. Uh, this is partly due uh, to the fact that they will have to install three SCRs which remove nitrogen oxide at the Tri-State Craig facility in Craig, Colorado. Uh, and so I'd like to ask you to confirm this because I know you don't have the numbers in front of you, but I'm asking you to uh, comment on the rural co-ops which are nonprofits and member owned. And so the first question is, uh, do you agree that some customers will see increases in their rates due to some of the rules EPA is trying to implement? We actually have modeled some, some slight increases in energy and they differ region to region. And so those rates would increase. Uh, how do you propose the how do you propose that nonprofits comply uh, with these rate increases apart from passing on these costs to the ratepayers? Mr. God, I, I would indicate that our analysis that we did with the mercury and air toxic standard indicated that, that the energy prices would likely fall within the range of what we have seen in 1990 in historic fluctuations. We saw between 1 and 3 percent increases, which means about for an American family about $3 a month increase uh, on their electricity bill. And so that's just the, the only way they can do that is to pass those increased costs on to their ratepayers. I, I, I have trouble answering that question because I don't live in the energy world, but my understanding is that, that compliance can be achieved by lower demand as well as increased generation, fuel switching, and a number of techniques. Thank you. You'll back my time. Would the gentleman yield to me yes, for a moment? Yield. I, I think that's the point that we're, we're trying to drive home. You're right, Ms. McCarthy, you do not live in the energy world. But then you, you make extrapolations on gigawatt issues that are a reliability concern based upon the chart I saw. DOE rolls over an acceptance of, of your electricity generation or lack thereof analysis. And, and when you have the people in the field who are disputing, disputing that analysis on the gigawatt issue, we're debating with an environmental agency, not our Department of Energy. Uh, and, and if the analysis were, was close to what industry, financial people, FERC, EEI would say, then we, we would cut some leeway. But the administration's proposal, uh, actually the environmental rules and the, and the effect on the electric grid of 10 gigawatts is laughable. And so we, you can do all the analysis on emittance you want, but we reject the premise that you are experts in electricity generation, cost of building plants, and developing those. Um, it, uh, you still have a couple minutes. This allows me to ask Mr. Moore or make a point 
uh, Congressman Griffith mentioned uh, uh, a lake facility and property. Of course, Vicki Hartzler would be remit, would be happy if I would mention Lake of the Ozarks and those issues of those, which is in a commutable distance in my district. But uh, you all have been somewhat helpful in easing some of the concerns. I think there's some still issues out there, and we would hope that you would. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Uh, we have not addressed the question of whether or not there are rights to judicial review on these different questions, and if so, how they are applied. Could I ask just a couple yes or no questions on this? The time is my colleague from Colorado. Well, I don't want to intrude on his time. I'd be happy to I, yield to the gentleman from Michigan if a gentleman. I'm, I'm done. Well, you're all very kind, and I thank you. Um, these for um, Ms. Hoffman of DOE. Is an order under Section 202C currently subject to judicial review? Yes or no? Yes. Uh, can somebody file a suit now to uh, stop an emergency order as being antithetical to the public interest, either for health, safety, or other reasons? Yes or no? They have to seek a rehearing. Now, would it, be, would it still be subject to review if the Olson bill were to be adopted? Yes. Uh, today, there's a question of whether DOE can actually order a generator to violate a law administered by EPA or another agency. If this bill were to be signed into law, would this action put a thumb on the scale in the eyes of the court that Congress intends Section 202C to trump environmental laws? This goes to Ms. McCarthy. My understanding is that it would give uh, essentially a pass on environmental laws with the exception of OSHA. Is there in any statute or any regulation or in any um, cooperative management agreement between the sundry departments down there a provision which requires consultation or which permits consultation between DOE EPA and or the state agencies which were participants in these matters as we went through the case that we're discussing today. There, I'm sorry, I don't believe there's any written requirement okay. for that, but because environmental laws have not been preempted from, from, for compliance purposes, that DOE consultation always includes EPA to ensure that we're not conflicting the generators now and does, comply with two does, e, does EPA, uh, do both of the agencies, EPA and DOE, have to consult? Or may they consult? Or may they not consult? What is the law on that? Uh, we have to consult to the benefit of the generator to ensure that, that we're providing them a clear pathway is to that, run. In is a way that, that required by both agencies or not? It is not required. The law does not have any um, statement, the existing law or... Uh, if they do not consult, or if they do consult, is that appealable by any party or other, other person not a party? No. No? Mr. Chairman, I thank you for your courtesy, and I thank my colleague. Thank you very much. We thank Chairman Emeritus. I think your questions are very helpful. And uh, we would like to now, again, thank the first panel for your time and, and your uh, uh, due diligence um, in answering our questions. Um, and we'd like now to ask the second panel to join us.
Okay, we're almost getting there. If we can have uh, folks to, uh, take their seats and get the, the, the door in the uh, rear closed. Uh, we want to thank the second panel. Um, obviously, we have two groups, one on the, the first three on the reliability, the second, third from the um, hydro issues. Um, many of you are well experienced at congressional hearings and testimonies. Your full statement can be, will be submitted for the record. You'll have five minutes. Um, and I will um, recognize you left to right, uh, and then we got. And I'll recognize you left to right, and we can be we can begin. Um, first, I'd like to recognize uh, uh, the Honorable Betty Ann Kane, Chairman of the D.C. Public Service Commission. Um, uh, again, your full statements in the record. You have five minutes. Uh, welcome. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and uh, members of the committee. Um, you know. Uh, I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to be here uh, this morning to um, discuss uh, our comments on uh, the Resolve Environmental and Grid Reliability Conflicts Act of uh, 2012. Um, as we understand, the intention of the bill is to more clearly define the situations in which emergency orders may be issued under the Federal Power Act and to limit the liability of electric generators when obeying such an order. Uh, this bill speaks directly to a very difficult and challenging experience of the D.C. Public Service Commission in its efforts to ensure electric reliability service in the nation's capital. Um, and we believe that, uh, I'll speak of the experience um, and describe how enactment of the bill could prevent such situations in the future and hopefully could lead to a more timely resolution of these kinds of conflicts. Um, my attorneys always have me say that uh, nothing that I say in my testimony or in answering questions has any relationship to any open case currently before the D.C. Commission. Um, the D.C. Commission is an independent agency of the government of the District of Columbia. It was actually first established by Congress in 1913. We're coming up on celebrating our centennial next year and reaffirmed as a home rule charter agency uh, under the District Self-Government Act. Uh, it's a quasi-judicial regulatory agency, and like our fellow public utility commissions in the other 50 states, our statutory responsibility is to ensure the provision of safe, affordable, and adequate natural gas, electricity, and telecommunications services. Um, specifically, in relation to this legislation, we have a responsibility under district law and through our oversight of the Potomac Electric Power Company to ensure that the nation's capital has an adequate supply of electricity at all times. In the summer of 2005, um, a situation arose which has been alluded to. Um, at that time, we were served, the city was served by three must-run power plants, one of which, uh, none of which were actually owned by PEPCO. Uh, we are a restructured state. Um, and one of these, uh, all three of them are must-run units. Uh, one of these uh, plants, uh, which at the time was owned by the Merritt Company, an independent power provider, um, the Potomac River Generating Station, on August 22, 2005, issued a press release suddenly announcing it was going to shut down the plant in just two days. Uh, this plant is located in the city of Alexandria, just across the district, uh, the river from the district, doesn't supply any electricity to anyone in Virginia. Uh, it's connected to the district's power grid through several transmission lines that, that run, under, um, run under the river. Uh, the, we understand that Merritt announced its shutdown of the plant in response to emissions abatement concerns which had been raised by the Divi Divi Virginia Department of Environmental Quality uh, acting under the Federal Clean Air Act, and Merritt said that it could not satisfy uh, the department's concerns at any level of output. Apparently it had tried some reductions previously. The D.C. Commission immediately responded to this announced shutdown by filing an emergency petition on August 24th uh, asking the Federal uh, Energy Regulatory Commission and the Department of Energy to order the plant to continue to operate. The continued operation was critical to ensuring that the downtown sectors of the district, including the White House, the Capitol, and other important federal as well as district government agencies had adequate access to electric supplies. Remember, this was in the summer. Um, the plant was shut down for 28 days. Finally, on September 21, 2005, the company voluntarily resumed operations at a reduced level. I was not on the commission at the time, 
um, but my staff tells me that every day during the hot summer period at the end of the summer that the plant was not operating, they prayed for mild weather. The federal agencies did not respond for several more months. The Secretary of Energy issued an order in December of 2005 which directed the continued operation of the plant to ensure reasonable electricity reliability, but also said that the company shall utilize pollution, pollution, pollution control equipment and measures that maximize, uh, that to the maximum extent possible, reduce the magnitude and duration of any exceedance of the air quality standards. The Federal Energy Regulatory Commission issued its order in January 2006. Um, and that directed PEPCO and our RTO, PJM, uh, to come up with an immediate plan as well as a long-term plan for uh, transmission uh, to ensure uh, electric liability in the district. And finally, EPA issued its administrative compliance order in June 1st, 2006, about 10 months after the initial shutdown. Um, the, uh, were some extensions of the DOE order. Uh, so that uh, transmission could be, uh, capacity could be installed. The Commission itself uh, I issued an order uh, ordering building of new transmission lines. But during the time uh, that the lines were being built uh, and the DOE order was still in effect, um, the plant was operating uh, in order to supply electricity when needed. And during that time, the plant was fined uh, $52,000 while it was by uh, APA, while it was filed, excuse me, by Virginia, while it was operating under the DOE order. Uh, we believe that the resolving elect the legislation would relieve must run generators uh, from having to pay such fines while they're operating under an emergency order from another agency under Section 202C of the Power Act, and we all, therefore, we support the legislation. Um, we also hope that the bill could be useful in assuring that emergency orders can be obtained in sufficient time to compel a generating plant to continue ordering, continue operating. For the, as I said, for the 28 days that uh, we were without the plant operating, the electricity reliability was imperiled, um, and it was another 118 days uh, from the first shutdown until we got the DOE order, making them uh, ordering them to uh, to resume operation. Only the voluntary decision of the plant's owner shortened the period of heightened risk. Um, this was not a comfortable experience for the Commission, and it should not be a comfortable experience for any Commission. No state agency wants to be in a position to have to go to a federal agency and ask them to do something that's going to cause a company to violate what another federal agency ordered them to do or what another state has ordered them to do. And we believe that the legislation can help resolve that conflict while supporting the obligation of state utility commissions to carry out their responsibility for the reliability and safety of electric transmission, distribution, and supply systems under their jurisdiction. Thank you, uh, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. I'd now like to uh, recognize um, uh, Ms. Deborah Raggio, um, Vice President, Government and Regulatory Affairs, and Assistant General Counsel of Gen on Energy Incorporated. Uh, welcome. And you're recognized for five minutes. Good morning, Chairman and members of the subcommittee. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to testify in support of H.R. 4273, the Resolving uh, Environmental and Grid Reliability Conflicts Act of 2012, which I would call a good government and truly bipartisan piece of legislation. I thank Congressman Olson and Doyle for working together in such a bipartisan fashion, along with Congressman Green, Gonzalez, Sullivan, Terry, and Barton, who are also co-sponsors on this subcommittee. To begin with, I'd like to share four observations on the legislation. First, there currently is a conflict of law. And notwithstanding Ms. McCarthy's statement, a generator can be ordered to run by the Department of Energy. And if the generator has no choice but to violate an environmental limit in following the order, the company can be subject to fines as well as lawsuit liability. The situation is fundamentally unfair, and it also creates potential reliability issues during an emergency. Second, this is not a one-company issue. I'm testifying for Genon because we've experienced this conflict firsthand, but it could happen to any generator. Accordingly, the legislation is widely supported by various participants in the industry. These groups and companies don't always agree on all issues. 
It includes APPA, NRECA, EPSA, EEI, and companies like Exelon, NRG, Alliant Energy, Ameren, We Energies, as well as Genon. These are quite a diverse group of companies. In addition, as you heard, all four FERC commissioners and Secretary of Energy Chu have recognized the need to remedy the conflict. Third, the legislation is not anti-environmental or anti-EPA. I believe it does not impact compliance with any recent EPA regulations or provide an avenue for a generator to shirk its responsibilities. Environmental compliance is paramount, but reliability during an emergency is paramount as well. And that reliability could be threatened by a company questioning whether to follow the DOE order and run during an emergency or not run and comply with its environmental limits. Under this legislation, a company is only protected if it has no choice but to violate an environmental limit when it runs as directed by the Department of Energy for an emergency. There is no environmental hall pass here. Rather, if a company runs as ordered by DOE during an emergency, it will just not be sued or fined for an unavoidable environmental violation. Fourth, the legislation is not intended as a criticism of EPA or DOE. Both agencies have to manage their own statutory mandates. It is simply a fact that those mandates may conflict during a reliability emergency. This wasn't an intent that they conflict, but they do. Uh, therefore, a statutory fix is needed, otherwise a company is stuck in the middle of the two conflicting mandates. Today, Section 202C of the Federal Power Act gives DOE the authority to require a generator to operate only in the event of a true emergency as needed to meet and serve the public interest. Twice, Mirant Corporation, a predecessor company to Genon, was required to run for reliability. And both times, we had no choice but to violate the environmental limit to keep the lights on. In both situations, we were subject to fines or citizen lawsuit liability. Any generator, coal, gas, or otherwise, could face this situation. For example, a company could be ordered by DOE to run for cybersecurity reasons. Or a dual fuel gas plant could be ordered to run on oil because gas is unavailable. And the company may have no choice but to exceed an environmental limit in order to comply with the order. There needs to be clear government directive to run in the event of a true emergency. In such event, the government should want a company to salute and operate as directed by DOE to keep the lights on. A company should not be running to court for an answer during an emergency. The emergency could require a very quick response and a court may not be able to act in time. This conflict needs to be decided by the legislature, not by a court, especially during an emergency. The legislation gives no additional authority to DOE. They have the authority currently nor does it take authority away from EPA, which does not have jurisdiction under the Federal Power Act. It merely prevents a company from being fined or sued for complying with a Federal order. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with you about this issue, and I am very pleased to answer any questions you might have. Thank you um, for yielding and saving us some time um, and yielding back. Uh, Chair now recognizes uh, Mr. Um, Stephen Brick, he was a consultant on behalf of the Environmental Integrity Project. Sir, you're welcome. Your written statement's in the record, and you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning. My name is Steve Brick, and I appear today on behalf of the Washington-based Environmental Integrity Project, a nonprofit, sorry, nonprofit organization advocating for more effective enforcement of environmental law. I'm an independent consultant, having worked for more than 30 years on various energy and environmental policies. During that time, I have represented public utility commissions, state and federal environmental agencies, a wide range of nonprofit groups, and various private industries. I appreciate the opportunity to address the subcommittee. I have two concerns with the proposed legislation. First, I think it's unnecessary. U.S. DOE emergency orders have been issued only rarely, and we expect this to continue in the future. Existing systems and regulations can and are being adapted to address grid reliability environment conflicts. Second, the legislation grants an environmental hall pass anytime DOE issues an emergency order. Environmental regulators, either U.S. EPA or its designee, would be cut out of the process. Environmental controls of all sorts could be turned off during emergency situations with impunity. 
In addition, the emergency order could become an avenue for exempting older fossil plants from making required upgrades. This would result in unacceptable environmental mm -hmm. degradation and would potentially distort power markets. The problem that the legislation purports to fix is not unfolding in an emergency fashion. Power sector and its regulators are dealing with the intersection of three factors. First, significant levels of pending fossil plant retirements. Second, new federal air regulations affecting the electric power sector. And third, a need to maintain the reliability of the nation's electric transmission system. None of these factors is a surprise. The nation's power plant fleet is aging and as new, more efficient capacity has been built, it has become widely understood that some older plants would retire. The utility mercury and air toxic standards, finalized in December 2011, have been under consideration for over two decades, so the electric power sector has had more than adequate time to prepare. Transmission system reliability has been a utility concern for many decades. Plant retirements and new environmental regulations are already being considered within established transmission planning processes. The changes to the emergency provisions of the Federal Power Act proposed in the bill are the wrong response to our actual situation. We are not faced with an emergency, nor is it in the public interest to resolve all potential conflicts in emergency mode. Such a practice would unnecessarily tip the balance away from environmental protection. I firmly believe that there are legitimate concerns about the reliability impacts of projected power plant retirements but these are already being addressed by regional transmission organizations, power plant owners, economic and environmental regulators, and the public. Environmental factors can be incorporated into existing planning and regulatory processes in an orderly fashion, ensuring that the health and resource benefits of all environmental regulations are achieved while maintaining grid reliability. In the very rare instance of a DOE emergency order, two things can be done to mitigate the environmental impact. First, require that all existing environmental controls continue to operate. This is needed to prevent environmental backsliding. Second, condition emergency orders arising from retirement deferrals using the following procedure. First, specify the transmission situations under which the power plant will be needed to protect reliability. Second, determine the environmental consequences of the projected operation. Third, assess options for completing transmission upgrades needed to permit retirement. And fourth, limit waivers from environmental regulations to those few hours of operation needed to address reliability shortfalls identified in the analysis. Under this approach, plant operation would be strictly limited to the specific reliability conditions. Deferred retirements should be limited to one two-year period, giving time for transmission owners to complete necessary upgrades or otherwise resolve the emergency. The operation of plants operating under a deferred retirement scenario should be very low, generally less than 200 hours per year. This procedure allows continued operation of power plants for a limited time under strict reliability conditions to address genuine emergencies. It would not force owners to invest in new pollution control equipment on old plants that they intend to retire. The approach harmonizes reliability and environmental concerns, and it does not require new legislation to be put into effect. Thank you very much for your time, and I'm happy to any, answer any questions you have. Thank you, uh, Mr. Brick. Now I'd like to recognize Mr. Andrew Monroe, uh, Director, Consumer Service Division, Great County Public Utility District, on behalf of the National Hydropower Association. Sir, you're welcome, and you're recognized for five minutes. Good morning, Chairman Whitfield and members of the subcommittee. I'm Andrew Monroe, immediate past president of the National Hydropower Association, NHA. Thank you for this opportunity to share NHA's perspective on the Hydropower Regulatory Efficiency Act of 2012. We urge swift markup of the bill and support House passage as soon as possible. We commend the bipartisan leadership shown by the bill's co-sponsors. In particular, I wish to thank Congresswoman Kathy McMorris Rogers, who is from my uh, uh, home state, the other Washington. My message today is simple. Hydropower is also part of the solution. This message is for President Obama, for Congress, and the American people. This bill supports sustainable hydropower generation that will strengthen our economy, environment, and also our renewable energy supplies. Think about this one statistic. Of the 80,000 dams that currently exist in the United States, just 3% are utilized to generate renewable energy. Just 3%. The Hydropower Regulatory Efficiency Act puts America on a path 
to tap this available existing infrastructure and employ hundreds of thousands of American workers. With a current generation capacity of 100,000 megawatts, hydropower, as you know, is America's largest renewable and represents 7 to 8 percent of all U.S. generation. It also supports a strong economy, employing 300,000 American workers. NHA recently completed a supply chain snapshot that illustrates 2,000 U.S. companies working in hydro across the United States. One of the myths about U.S. hydropower is that there are no new opportunities. In fact, the opposite is true. Hydro has a lot more to offer. According to a Navigant study, 60,000 megawatts of new hydro capacity and 1.4 million cumulative jobs could be created in the next 15 years. Now, these are domestic, good-paying jobs in manufacturing, construction, engineering, and operations. In fact, 75,000 megawatts of hydropower is currently in the FERC queue. Now, the U.S. hydropower industry is absolutely committed to sustainable growth that is sustainable in every way. And we commend the Hydropower Regulatory Efficiency Act because it is a recognized, it, it, it employs common sense, balanced terms to support, to support growth with our existing infrastructure. According to the Department of Energy, there's 12,000 megawatts of new hydro that could be developed at existing non-power dams. Now, this would increase U.S. hydro capacity by 15 percent. Let me repeat, 12,000 megawatts without building another new dam. That's enough energy to serve 4.5 million residential customers. One more data point. Hydropower's attributes, being renewable, reliable, and affordable, was the primary factor for BMW SGL to build a new automotive carbon fibers plant in my utility service territory in Grant County, Washington. With initial investment of $100 million and 80 new local jobs, it was reliable hydropower that was the primary reason for this new manufacturing plant to be built in the United States, and specifically in Grant County, Washington. Now, NHA's ambitious goal to double sustainable hydropower and jobs is achievable, and it's necessary. Further, it lines with the Department of Energy's Wind and Water Pro Program goal to achieve 15% of the nation's electricity using hydropower by the year 2030. This bill contains balance and common sense provisions. It supports a dynamic agenda that's supported in a bipartisan fashion. And I'm just going to mention two provisions here quickly. Section 6 requires FERC to investigate a two-year pilot licensing process for hydro at non-power dams and pump storage, closed-loop pump storage projects. NHA appreciates past efforts to improve the licensing process. However, the timelines for this type of sustainable hydro is not on par with, for instance, a gas plant which is about a two-year process. We think this makes a great positive step forward without, while still maintaining environmental standards and performance. We also see significant potential in the low-impact small hydro and conduit projects. Due to the lack of economies of scale for these small projects, the licensing costs serve as a financial disincentive. This bill makes another positive step forward for these small, low-impact projects. In closing, I wish to highlight the collaborative demonstration, uh, the collaboration de demonstrated by two uh, organizations appearing before you today, American Rivers and the National Hydropower Association. For the past several years, we have mutually and purposely called upon our organizations to lead together in how we can help support a sustainable energy future. We hope that this is just the beginning of more collaborations to come and we invite Congress to join us in supporting this bill for swift passage. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Monroe. And our next guest is Mr. Kurt Johnson. Kurt is the president of the Colorado Small Hydro Association. Mr. Johnson, you have five minutes for an opening statement. Please hit the little button there in front of you, sir. Thank you. And I'm a PowerPoint guy, so if you could bear with me and look up at the screen. Uh, thank you. I'd like to uh, commend the leadership of Congresswoman McMorris Rogers and to get on this bipartisan common sense legislation. Uh, it's a long overdue, cost effective, common sense measure, and I'm pleased that we're finally making it happen thanks to the leadership of these members of Congress and this committee. Um, hydropower is not a new idea. Uh, pictured here, uh, this is the Ames Power Station. This is actually about three miles from my house. Uh, went online in 1891. Uh, small hydro, typically, it's local. 
It's reliable. It's clean. It was a good idea 120 years ago. Uh, it's still a good idea. We can have a lot more of it if we can get the regulatory reform uh, that's being discussed here today. Small hydro is a job growth opportunity. Uh, in Colorado, uh, we've got hundreds of folks currently employed in the industry, and we can get a lot more jobs in Colorado, in small hydro, if we can get the right policies in place. Uh, small hydro is an economic development opportunity for rural areas, probably for obvious reasons. Many hydro projects are located in rural areas. You have a number of job creation benefits initially when you build a project. I might work with carpenters, plumbers, electricians, concrete pourers on project construction. Um, there is also ongoing financial benefit associated once a given project is in place. A rancher like this might have an electricity bill that he has to pay to spin a center pivot irrigation system with a small hydro system that can cover that bill. For larger systems, once you have a hydro plant in place, say at an existing dam, you will have an ongoing revenue source that will lower costs to the water users and create benefits in perpetuity. Andrew talked about the uh, 80,000 dams uh, nationwide that currently don't have hydro. Uh, in Colorado, various federal and state assessments have estimated we've got a couple thousand. Um, pictured here are some examples of local projects that I happen to be familiar with and have worked on. Um, existing dams, existing conduits that do not have hydro uh, that are potentially economic opportunities to build hydro. Uh, towns have opportunities for generating hydropower. In the mountains where I live, a typical municipality will have, uh, next slide please, typical municipality will have a, you know, a water line running a thousand feet up a, up a hill, put various pressure reduction valves um, to supply their municipal treatment plant. Um, in most cases, or many cases, those can be retrofitted cost-effectively with small hydro if you didn't have burdensome regulations impeding the development of these types of small projects. The current FERC process is basically broken for small hydro permitting. I, I think the FERC staff has made a valiant effort in recent years within the existing uh, statutory and regulatory framework. However, um, for particularly small projects, the system just plain does not make sense. Uh, you can have situations where the cost of complying with FERC regulations exceeds the cost of the hydro equipment itself. It just does not make sense. Uh, we in Colorado over the last couple of years had a pilot program to seek to streamline the FERC licensing or permitting program. Um, to date, we've got two projects that have completed the system, uh, another four uh, that are currently before FERC. We shouldn't have two, we should have 200 a year that are being Approved and built in Colorado. I think that experiment has demonstrated that the system is still time consuming and costly. Basically, uh, the system is broken. If you're, this next slide shows a picture of the table of contents for what you might expect for a typical conduit exemption application. Uh, you know, requiring this level of detailed regulations for non controversial small projects on existing conduits does not make any sense. Um, it's stifling development, it's, done st it's stifled development for decades in the past, and it's continuing to do so today. There's enormous costs there. You have projects not built, jobs not created, rural, jo rural incomes not increased, and harmful additions not avoided simply because of these burdensome regulations for, again, non-controversial small projects. Building a project, you have to run around and get lots of letters from various agencies, which takes a lot of time. Well-intentioned folks, but nothing necessarily moves fast in government. Small hydro is already pretty complicated um, for some of the reasons noted here. It's unnecessary to have the kind of permitting requirements um, added on top of what can already be complex project development. The bill being just talked about here today creates what I describe as Hydro 1040 EZ, which uh, is a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant idea. Again, this is long overdue. This enables small, non-controversial projects to get out of the system quickly and leave FERC staff to focus on the more important and more controversial projects. As discussed, the bill expedite hydro development in existing non-powered dams nationwide. Um, the bill also calls for some new resource assessments completed by the federal government. Um, they're pictured here. I actually have a copy of a report completed by Reclamation last year. These types of resource assessment reports have led directly to new development, new business for developers like myself. It's sort of the kernel that starts the whole process. It's a really brilliant idea that's included in this bill. So in summary, I think, again, long overdue, common sense, bipartisan reform legislation. I thank the committee for their work on this issue and be happy to answer any questions.
And our last opening statement is going to be given by Mr. Matthew Rice. Matthew, Mr. Rice is the Colorado Director of American Rivers. We've got five minutes for your opening statement. There you go. Hit, hit the microphone. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Good morning, and thank you for inviting me to testify. My name is Matt Rice, and I'm the Colorado Director for American Rivers. I'm also a lifelong fly angler, fly angler kayaker, and former fly fishing guide. I love rivers and consider myself extremely lucky that my job is to protect them. American Rivers is the nation's leading voice for healthy rivers and the communities that depend on them. We believe rivers are vital to our, our health, safety, quality of life, and to the economies that, de that depend on them. American Rivers supports the Hydropower Regulatory Efficiency Act. We have worked for years trying to improve hydropower's environmental performance, and we recognize that hydropower will be an important part of our nation's future energy mix, especially given the urgent need to reduce the use of fo fossil fuels. The key, is, the key is getting hydropower right. Even small hydropower can have a huge impact on river health and the future generations that depend on those rivers. Poorly done hydropower has caused some species, species to go extinct and put others, including some with extremely high commercial value, at grave risk. However, there is tremendous potential and growing interest in developing incidental, hydro, incidental hydropower projects that add new generation to existing dams and conduits. These projects cause less environmental harm than new dam construction and are the focus of this bill. After we opened our, our, our Colorado office last year, we started working with the Colorado Governor's Energy Office on a streamlined permitting hydropower pilot program, the result of a memorandum of understanding with the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Our experience with this innovative program offers some important lessons that are relevant to the Hydropower Regulatory Efficiency Act. First, giving the public an opportunity to review new hydropower projects does more than protect natural resources. It also offers developers certainty, giving them a clear idea of controversy and viability before they make a big investment. Second, existing regulations are flexible enough to expedite permitting of good hydropower projects. A typical FERC license can take up to five years to secure, but after 16 months of the Colorado's program, FERC has issued two exemptions, has four additional projects poised to receive final approval, and one additional project pending submission. Only two, only two applicants had completed their project design upon enrollment, and both those applicants have already received exemptions. The value of the program is even clearer when viewed in historical context. In 16 months, seven projects have been approved or are near approval. Um, only 15 new projects have been approved in Colorado over the past 20 years. Third, the MOU pilot program demonstrated that applicants are not always in the best position to judge whether or not their project will be controversial. Out of 20, 28 applications submitted to the state, only 10 met the criteria, criteria for expedited permitting, often because they were, too, too, they, were, they were considered too controversial. Those projects can still be permitted, but they will require additional level of scrutiny to ensure that they are not causing harm. Public review and comment works. The 45-day public review period outlined in Section 4B and Section 4C of the Act is critically important because it provides a safeguard to protect against projects that are disguised as conduits, um, such as an example in Aspen, Colorado that I cite in my written testimony. However, Section 4 also provides de developers with the certainty with the certainty that truly non-controversial projects can receive expedited review and move forward quickly. I'm proud that the Hydropower Regulatory Efficiency Act is the result of a spirit of collaboration, both among members from both sides of the aisle, as well as the industry and conservation groups. Here's why I think the Hydropower Regulatory Efficiency Act gets the balance right. First, the act encourages appropriate hydropower development, like adding turbines to non-powered dams, canals, pipes, or adding updated, more efficient equipment to existing dams. Second, the Act protects the public interest provi providing the 45-day public review period I refer referenced earlier. Finally, the Act will help improve the regulatory process while avoiding the stale concept that regulations are the only barriers that need to be removed. At American Rivers, we're not fans of process for its own sake. Time is money for environmental NG NGOs, too. But make no mistake, it is, because, it is because, not in spite of, our regulatory system that hydropower has fewer environmental impacts today than it did years ago. Getting to, the, getting to these solutions takes careful study that can, in some cases, still take longer than two years. These laws and regulations are there for good reason and work well, but that doesn't mean they can't be improved. Our experience with the Colorado program has shown us that there are good projects that can get permitted in two years or less. We want good projects to get built faster, but it's not good for rivers or the industry, frankly, if a bad project gets fast-tracked and causes real damage. We're committed to continuing to work with the committee, the industry, and others to achieve the twin goals of more capacity and better environmental outcomes. Thank you for the opportunity to testify before this committee and look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Rice. Now we'll go to member questions for five minutes. And the first questions will be asked by my colleague from Washington, Ms. McForest Rogers. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and I wanted to direct my uh, questions to Mr. Monroe. And thanks again for making the trip from Washington State to be here. Uh, great testimony. Uh, and appreciate uh, you just uh, highlighting the important role that hydropower is playing in the Pacific Northwest. Um, I wanted to ask if you would just elaborate a little bit more. You talked about BMW, but we've seen where hydropower really has transformed the economy in, in uh, Washington State. Um, and there's other companies, high-tech companies, uh, that are locating in uh, the basin area because of low-cost hydropower, reliable. And I just wanted you to at least uh, elaborate a little bit more on what other job creation we have seen in recent years. I'd be happy to, and thank you. This uh, BMW plant is uh, a great example uh, highlighting how hydropower in itself, because it's reliable, it's a base load, it's, it's available. Uh, BMW, SGL, when they were looking worldwide to, for their new automotive carbon fiber, which is uh, a, a lightweight, strong plastics material that will go into their new all-electric vehicle, uh, they wanted a life cycle emissions-free resource. Um, it was important for their customers uh, that they have that. And as they looked around the world, the um, wind was not reliable enough. Hydropower was the renewable that was reliable for them. Uh, so they have reiterated to us that that was the very key reason that they ended up locating in Grant County. It was, I think, between us and Hydro Quebec. Uh, and they decided to go with Grant County in the United States. Um, but it's an important local uh, economic development. Uh, opportunity where a primarily agricultural based rural populated area um, and then we also have data centers we have Microsoft Yahoo that are locating in our service territory because of that uh, renewable and reliable electricity mm -hmm. great we we often uh, tell the positive story of hydropower and how it transformed Washington State the whole Columbia Basin project uh, uh, in many ways and you can even point to Boeing uh, locating Kaiser Aluminum, but it's, 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 it's exciting to see these more recent companies that are expanding because of what hydropower has to offer. Now, a little earlier, we were hearing uh, a little about the administration's energy independence goals moving forward. Uh, would you just elaborate on the steps that we've taken in recent years uh, and how we got DOE, Department of Energy, to actually commit to a goal of doubling hydropower by 2030. Um, I was disappointed that it wasn't listed or included in President Obama's uh, chart there, but would you just elaborate a little bit more on what we've seen from Department of Energy recently? Well, we're disappointed as well. I mean, we've really been talking to the administration about um, having hydropower as part of the overall solution. And we have done our, as an industry, we have taken the time to do our analytics, to really study what are the opportunities. It's been, I think, a mindset that we're not going to build a new Hoover Dam. Well, that's, that's true. But now what we found is we have already invested in a lot of infrastructure in the country. We have uh, dams that exist already. We can modernize our existing hydropower. There's small, low-impact conduit power. So through our job studies, we've shown that we can expand, support job creation in every state in the, in the country uh, that also expand our renewable energy supplies. Um, we're still trying to get that through to um, the top levels of the administration. We are getting support, though, at the other lower levels of the Department of Energy. We're happy to see that. But we really need everybody to understand um, and change their thinking about hydro that we can have both hydropower and fish. Yes. Well, and, and to Mr. Monroe and Mr. Johnson, if you would just uh, talk a little bit about how hydro can, hydropower uh, can contribute overall to grid security and reliability, uh, which is also on the forefront of Congress's mind. And uh, it's an important uh, base load resource. I think in terms of our energy security, it's absolutely essential that if we can expand sustainable hydropower and, and closed loop pump storage opportunities, we absolutely ought to do that. Um, Grant PUD, as an example, we're 100% we're renewable. We're, uh, most of that is hydro generation. We do have wind. We're also integrating wind in Montana uh, to keep a reliable system. But if uh, after conservation, if we were to develop a resource, it's a combined cycle gas plant, uh, which is fine. That's a baseload resource. If there's opportunities, though, where we could develop hydropower, um, again, that's really the only renewable that's base load that can also provide the same amount of reliability that, say, a gas plant could. Probably also worth pointing out that. Probably also worth pointing out that it it 
can be distributed in small, and so if you can have distributed base load clean energy, um, that enhances grid reliability so that, you know, if you have one giant plant that goes down, you've got a problem. If you have a number of smaller, also base load plants, only one goes down, you have less of a problem. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank Mr. Rice with American Rivers for your testimony and your support of the legislation, too, and I yield back. Thank you. The Chair recognizes my colleague, Mr. Doyle, from Pennsylvania for five minutes of questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Ms. Raggio, the testimony on our first panel seemed to indicate that there's conflicting stories about the 2005 202 c order. Could you clarify what violation uh, what the violation was that led to a fine from Virginia DEQ and how many hours uh, Genon was actually in violation of environmental regulations or merit? Yeah, absolutely. Um, there, there is some confusion, and I can actually say that I'm probably the only one on either panel who lived through it. Um, we ran in accordance with the DOE order. Uh, the order took approximately four months to be issued. At that time, it was very clear about environmental limits and what we could do. After that, an administrative consent order almost a year after we shut down was imposed, and the DOE order adopted the administrative consent order. We ran under that. Both of those orders had very clear uh, procedural requirements we had and protections we had to follow, and we followed them all. Throughout the process, DEQ committed, as they did in their comments to DOE, that they did not believe that DOE had the authority and they would enforce against us. We had one, one three-hour NACS violation in 2007, and when we did, DOE, or DEQ was true to their word. They came in, they said, you violated, and they issued an NOV. They also said we did not follow certain um, pollution control requirements in their allegations, but we could not follow those requirements and still be in compliance with the DOE order. Um, but we were in compliance with the ACO as evidence that EPA did not enforce against us, and nor did DOE. So it was an after-the-fact view back as to what we had done. But to say that we were not fined because we ran under the DOE order is wrong. We would Thank not have had the exceedance but for the order. Thank you for the clarification. Certainly. Uh, Mr. Brick, uh, first of all, I want to say there are many things in your testimony that I agree with, uh, like the fact that legitimate concerns about re reliability impacts of projected power plant retirement should be addressed by RTOs. Uh, I, I agree with that. I'm, I'm just not sure I understand some of your concerns. You tell us uh, in your testimony, quote, that the problem this legislation purports to fix is not unfolding in an emergency fashion. I, I just want to be clear. I don't believe compliance time for EPA regulations are creating an emergency, and certainly not one that warrants a 202C order. But I do think it's foolish to ignore the fact that we're asking for great changes from our, our electric generating fleet, changes and upgrades that we need and that I support. Uh, the need for those changes, along with lower fuel costs, has already spurred the retirement of over 100 coal-fired plants, and most of those retirements are in my neck of the woods. We just have one tool of last resort for power supply emergencies, uh, and that's the Section 202 order. Um, do you think that tool has ambiguities about which federal law to follow? First of all, let me say I'm not a lawyer. So, um, uh, and neither am I, sir. You're, you're asking me for a legal opinion when I'm not really qualified to give one. But I think uh, it's clear from the testimony that we've heard that there is some potential conflict in the in the in in the law. And so, do you think, if that's the case, do you think it's wise that we try to address uh, and try to fix any ambiguities in our uh, law so that power suppliers know what to expect when a 202 order is issued? Um, it isn't, I, and once again, I'm, I'm offering you a legal opinion when I don't really have the basis for doing that. It isn't obvious to me that that can't be done perfectly reasonably without making any statutory changes. The agencies know how to talk to each other, um, and um, you know, if anything, it seems to me that that the that the that the single example that we've heard about this morning, and again, I don't have all the facts on that, so I can't really talk um, authoritatively about it. Um, that's 
seems to me to be kind of a bad example, and I'd like to think that we've learned from that bad example, and we're not going to make that mistake again going forward. Well, we've only had two instances in 34 years, and we're 0 for 2 uh, when it comes from addressing the ambiguities. And I think that's what has us concerned, that, that uh, in the two instances where we've asked generators to come online, uh, there was a loss, citizen lawsuit in one case and a fine by uh, Virginia DEQ and the others. And that's all we're trying to address, these ambiguities in the law. Um, and uh, I think, you know, between now and markup time, uh, if we hear any good suggestions how to make it better, uh, we'll certainly incorporate them in the bill. But I want to thank you for your testimony today, Mr. Chairman. I see my time has expired. Thank you, my colleague. And the Chair yields himself five minutes for questions. Um, my question is going to be for you, Ms. Raggio. First of all, my colleagues should know that uh, Ms. Raggio's employer, Genon, was formerly Miron, which is the poster child of why we're here today. I mean, because they're the ones who are exposed to conflicting regulations, putting reliability compliance in direct conflict with environmental regulations, uh, forcing them to choose uh, how to proceed and expose themselves to legal liability. Um, and I realize that these cases are rare. This would have been two of them, as my colleague from Pennsylvania mentioned. But with EPA's regulations, this, this explosion of regulations, shutting down our coal plants all across the country, um, we've got these, mar we had pretty good power, uh, excessive power grids, but we've got a very slim margin right now. And just one example of that from the real world, the cross-state air pollution rule, CASPER. When EPA announced that they were enacting that rule, their, their, their rulemaking, and they included text in that almost immediately, uh, um, Illuminate, the largest coal producer in Texas, announced that they would shut down two coal plants. Our state's the largest, fastest growing state in the country. We cannot lose power generators in Texas if we want to keep our people healthy. And so, Ms. Raggio, I'd like to give you an opportunity to respond to all the comments and concerns you've heard, particularly from the prior panel. I mean, you were said to be uh, a repeat offender. I heard that from the EPA witness. Um, talk about, and then they mentioned that you may have some perverse incentives if H.R. 4273 becomes law um, to exceed your permits and not upgrade your facilities in hopes of having some sort of grid crisis where you can, you know, have this done through 202C. Want to set the record straight? Well, to the extent we've offended any law, um, we did it on our own, uh, except for these two situations we weren't ordered to do so. And, and that's the problem. When a company makes a mistake or acts improperly, it pays the fine and it is enforced against. It's a completely different situation when you're complying with a federal order and then facing those, those penalties and fines. Um, I find it confusing how a company could plan its long-term compliance in hopes that DOE would come in and issue a 202C order. Um, I almost think that would require some kind of collusion between a Department of Energy and the company to circumvent a requirement that gives you a pretty long lead time to comply. It's also an extremely transparent process, compliance right now. My company is deciding right now for 2015-16, whether we're going to put on controls to comply, whether it's economic and affordable to do so, or whether we're going to um, shut down. And there's, it's difficult to see how someone could hide beneath FERC and the ISOs and the PSCs watching them and then pop up at the last minute and say, we're here, we didn't put on controls, DOE, save us. Um, I, I don't see that as, as really credible, although I assume anything is possible. Well, thank you for those answers. And if you do have that crystal ball, please let me know because we've got the second leg of the triple crown coming up. And you know, I'm not a horse guy, but I, <laughs> I rig that. Um, got a couple questions for you, uh, Chairwoman Kane, and thank you for coming here today. And I want to go back to 2005 when the DOE ordered uh, Murant, the Potomac genera River Generating Station, uh, to, to have, go into the status of must-run plant to operate to protect the electricity supply to Washington, D.C. The generator at the time, Merritt, complied with the order and was later fined by the Virginia Department of Environmental Quality for a three-hour NAQS violation. And you mentioned in your testimony that everyone's praying for mild weather. Walk me through what could have happened if a blackout occurred in Washington, D.C. Government buildings being shut down. You mentioned the White House, hospitals losing their power. You've got all these tourists here staying in hotels, maybe need some sort of medical care. Tell me what happened if Merritt hadn't complied and done what they're supposed to do and keep the power up and running. Yeah, it would have created a very, very difficult situation. Um, we depended on that plant uh, for uh, peaking in the uh, hot summer months. Uh, and the uh, DOE itself had said in its order 
that there would have been a blackout um, had uh, one of the other lines been down and the plant not be able to operate. Um, and so that's why um, DOE also obviously looked at it as, as a temporary situation. I want to address that too. It was an emergency. Um, and we did not take lightly going to a federal agency and asking them to order uh, a company to run, asking them to uh, essentially oppose the actions of a state. And the Virginia Department of Environmental Quality continued to oppose um, the petitions and the actions all the way through. Um, but we knew how serious the situation would have been, um, particularly in the summer. Um, and we then also, uh, in response to that, uh, acted very quickly ourselves to order uh, the uh, building of additional lines, two 69 kV lines and then two, uh, two 239 kV lines, um, so that the plant in the future, if there was a problem, could be bypassed. But that took, um, even by waiving, we waived uh, the six-month filing period, the notice period, we did an expedited proceeding. It still took um, 18 months to get all of those, um, uh, almost two years rather, to get the, the new big lines in place, which was uh, because there were conduits under the river, they could happen more quickly. But it was a very scary situation. And we know how people react in Washington, you know, when there's, there's a power outage just for, from a thunderstorm. And you can imagine if the whole downtown area, the whole central D.C. area, simply there was no power available. Thank you, ma'am. I'm out of time, but I think you'd say that violating a, a three-hour air quality standard may have averted a greater crisis here in our nation's capital. And I'm out of time. I yield to the, uh, the ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Waxman from California. Thank you very much for yielding to, to me. Uh, Ms. Raggio, I, I want to be sure that I understand the concerns the supporters of the Olson bill are trying to address. Your concern is the uh, rare instance where compliance with a 202C order will require a company to violate an environmental requirement. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Um, so when, an oper when operating under a 202C order, should a plant be allowed to run without limit or should it only be allowed to run when needed to address the reliability program? No. Or problem? It as set forth in the leg draft legislation, it should only be allowed to run during times necessary to meet the emergency and be consistent with any environmental law or regulations and endeavor to minimize adverse environmental impacts. Mm -hmm. Well, the bill seems to encourage limiting the time of operation to the time of the emergency need, but it's not mandatory. Do you think it ought to be mandatory? Um, it, it should be whatever you want the agency to be doing. I think sure. the mandatoriness should be upon the agency and its order, and then the company should have to comply with the order. Should a plant continue to run its existing pollution control equipment during the emergency operation? Absolutely, if you can do both. But the bill doesn't require this either. I'm concerned that the language in this bill is far broader than the issue uh, you say you want to address. Let me take an example. Uh, a plant is operating under a 202C order, generates coal ash that it places in an impoundment. The impoundment bursts, as it did in Kingston, Tennessee. The spill blankets nearby communities, pollutes miles of streams and rivers, and costs over a billion dollars to clean up. Under the language of this bill, the actions of operating the plant and disposing of the waste as required by the order, quote, uh, result in, end quote, noncompliance with multiple environmental laws. Thus, the company should be shielded from any liability for the damage. Uh, Ms. Raju, that's not your intent here, is it? Absolutely not. And I actually think that omission would not be considered necessary to comply with the DOE order, so it would not be protected. But that's just my opinion. Yeah. Uh, I fear the sweeping language of the bill provides that any action necessary to comply with the order that results in an environmental violation shall not be subject, uh, part, shall not subject to party to liability. So I, I'm concerned about that language. Mr. Brick, what are your views on this bill? Is it narrowly tailored? Does it preserve any formal role for the environmental regulators? regulators? Is it necessary and sensible? Um, I, 
as I said at the beginning, I don't think the bill is necessary. I think that um, existing processes can and are being used right now to harmonize environmental concerns with reliability concerns. I think that as drafted, it's too broad. And I, and I do think, although I, I completely agree with what I've heard from most people, that, that it's nobody's intent really to use it as a hall pass, plain language of the bill really does seem to be a hall pass. And um, in, in, in that case, you can conjure any kind of um, interruption or, or uh, of, of, of in-plant environmental equipment that might be deemed necessary somehow during, during the emergency. And I think it would be easy to um, change the language, to restrict it to, to more to more reasonable set. Particularly because, and I mean this is something that hasn't been said in this hearing, um, we designed these plants and their pollution control equipment to operate under all circumstances. Um, and, and so I, I, I really do, again, without going into all the details on the Potomac case, um, I really think that represents an exception, a rare exception, as opposed to something that's commonplace in the industry. Would it be safe to say that you don't think the le legislation is necessary, but if we're going to have legislation, it needs to be more carefully tailored? Yes. And is it also your view that we need to preserve a formal role for environmental regulators? Yes. And, uh, and, and in that way, the, the, the bill would balance out the concerns you think are already uh, could be met under existing law, but would it do any harm if we narrowed it down in that way? If, if it were narrowed in the way that you described, I don't think it would do any harm necessarily. I understand the concern that's motivating the supporters of this bill, uh, but the bill language goes way beyond what I think is necessary uh, to uh, address that narrow concern, so I agree with your views. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I uh, thank the ranking member of the full committee. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from West Virginia, Mr. McKinley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I was curious, uh, Mr. Brick, when I saw you on the panel, um, you were with the um, Environmental Integrity Project. And uh, back in August of uh, 2010, you all issued a, a, a document called um, uh, In Harm's Way lack of federal coal ash regulation endangers Americans and their environment. Were you involved in that study and in, in developing that report? Uh, no, sir. I'm a consultant to EIP and I work for them on electric reliability issues. Okay. I'm just, I was uh, curious to learn a little bit more of the perspective because it, it's um, the, the integrity, uh, you're, you're talking about the environmental integrity project when you read the report and, and see how it's been rebuked by other entities, it, it lessens the credibility of EIP. Um, and I was hoping that you may have be able to illuminate us, uh, educate us a little bit about how they could be so wrong in their findings. Uh, and you, but you're saying you have no awareness of it whatsoever. I, I haven't even read the report. But if you, if you had, uh, I mean, wouldn't, wouldn't you question if, if in the report there were things that it, in, in a report of a group that, that you represent that lack technical data, unfounded and misleading comments, not technically possible, statement is unsubstantiated, reference to contamination levels are incorrect, errors, statement is inappropriate, misleading, unsubstantiated, wouldn't that tend to make you uncomfortable with EIP's ability to testify on any matter, especially on the one in which they wrote a report? Uh, sir, I, I, all I can say is that um, I haven't had anything to do with that particular report, and all I can tell you is that on transmission reliability issues, which I take very seriously, I, I think I bring the highest level of technical expertise and credibility to, to, to EIP. I, I, I can't really make any but comments you had on projects my, that I haven't but been again, involved my in. But again, my point, I guess, was that if you had had a, the responses like that, wouldn't you question the integrity of a report that had that kind of rebuff by other environmental groups, specifically the Pennsylvania Department? If, if you had heard a Department of Environmental group making those kind of claims, wouldn't you question whether or not EIP has a legitimate issue? If you read that as, are you an engineer? Uh, no, sir, I'm an environmental scientist. Okay. Um, 
no sense harming you any further. I think you're representing a group that has lost some integrity uh, in, in what they've represented. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I look forward I'm sorry to you think so, and, I, and I'm sorry I can't be more responsible. Let's just, uh, 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 maybe you'll have someone else from the group come that, that can, can answer this because we're not getting good answers. And it was, I was looking forward to chatting with you a little bit about uh, your attack on an industry and, and what it's doing to fly ash in, in around this country uh, that's unsubstantiated based on incorrect, incorrect facts. So uh, I apologize if it's just you because you're not the one to do, but I'm, we're waiting for the right person to walk through those doors. I'll send the message along. Thank you very much. I yield back my time. Thanks, the gentleman from West Virginia. Ch chair now recognizes for five minutes the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Sarbanes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Ms. Raggio, in the first panel that we had here, Ms. Capps had asked Ms. Hoffman and Ms. McCarthy um, if they could describe or tell us the list of laws that would be covered by the liability under the bill. Um, that's this broad waiver um, that's in the bill, and, and they were not able to do that. I wonder if you have a sense or could describe some of the federal, state, local environmental laws and regs that would be um, would have liability waived with respect to them? Um, I can't really speak mm -hmm. to all the penelope of laws that are out there facing our power plants. I know there are many. Um, water, air, um, solid waste. The issue is really to be broad so that an emergency might impact any of those laws and a company might be ordered by DOE to take an action that would violate any of those laws. Mm -hmm. And if you have no choice but to comply, you shouldn't be um, fined or, or hit down or, or sued. Right. That's the intent. So the broadness was, I believe, the intent was to go to covering all of the potential things that could happen in an emergency that none of us can imagine because it's an emergency and it shouldn't happen. Um, but the, the key is that you can only be protected if taking that action was absolutely necessary to comply with the order. Mm -hmm. So if you're out there dumping things in the river and it wasn't required by the order, there's no protection there. Of course, the, 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 excuse me, the flip side of it being that broad and applying to all laws is that there's many out there uh, that you wouldn't think would need to be waived under the circumstances that one can imagine. And so you get into this situation where if the bill were interpreted as some of us have concerns, it might be that in effect the federal government's getting into the business of saying to a state or a locality, you know, we don't know what the particular uh, regulation or law that you may have on the books is, but um, whatever it is, it's going to be waived, which is a, which is a, fairly heavy-handed um, way to proceed here. And I think that's, that's one of the dangers that, that we have some concerns about. Do you know um, how many different environmental requirements have ever actually posed a conflict with a 202C order? Um, I only know it being invoked twice mm -hmm. per generation. Mm -hmm. um, our company was impacted both times. Uh, it was imposed during 2001 for the California energy crisis. We complied thinking the DOE order was still in place. It had expired by the summer of 2001, which to me is curious because we were all still in the height of the emergency. And what was the, the sort of category of regulation that was, was in conflict there? Air. Air, okay. It was air both times. Mm -hmm. So we've not seen it with respect to you know, endangered species, drinking water, waste disposal. So we don't have evidence of that kind of conflict having been presented Not yet. to this stage. Not yeah. yet, no. Um, well, I, I, I guess I share uh, Chairman Waxman's, um, I guess, anxiety that this might be overbroad. And I also have a sense that, um, that if the EPA, for example, is in a position to um, issue an administrative order in these um, emergency circumstances that's, that's very tailored to the situation at hand, um, that they're in a position to kind of limit what the um, liability protection would, 
apply to. And so I think we can perhaps refine this going forward. I'd like to get your views on that. I, I just note that the administrative order would not protect us from citizen lawsuit liability. Mm -hmm. So even if we worked it out with EPA, we could have an environmental group out there that doesn't care and will sue us. Mr. Brick, do you have a, an opinion on, on that? Um, if you're asking me do I have an opinion on whether or not a administrative order would still leave them open to well I, it's I, it, I, I, more do you have an opinion on on whether balance can be struck and uh, your view is that frankly the status quo allows for that now but whether this balance can be struck between you know our expectations on the environmental side and providing some kind of protection here yeah I, I think I think in answer to that yes I think a balance can be struck and I think the way you strike the balance is um, because again, I think these things unfold, even in the emergency situation, it takes 100 days to develop an order. Um, you know the likely environmental organizations to involve in the conversation, involve them in the conversation, and then I think you um, diminish the chances that you're going to have subsequent legal action. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from the Commonwealth of Virginia, Mr. Griffith, for five minutes of questioning. So, Mr. Brick, what do you do when the organizations are involved in one of them, not the federal government, uh, but the state government says, uh, yeah, we don't agree? I think that um, any case where there is delegated authority to the state, it's going to be the state air quality agency that should be involved in the conversation about what, what is going to happen during this reliability conversation. Okay. And here's where it gets really interesting for Ms. Raggio's company. As I understand it, Virginia didn't get that power. We just had the plant. So why would Virginia, which has its power delegated from uh, the, the, the feds, want to help out the District of Columbia and maybe Maryland, I don't know, but it help out the District of Columbia when they feel like that they may get in trouble? Because here's what I see might have happened. All right. Now, I don't know. I didn't study this issue at the time, and maybe I should have because I was vice chairman of the Joint Commission on Administrative Rules and Regulations of the Commonwealth of Virginia at that time, as well as being <laughs> the majority leader of the Virginia House of Delegates. But here's what I suspect, because we ran across this in some other situations where DEQ felt like if they didn't strictly enforce the rules, EPA would come in and take either their power away or their money away. Now, if you're sitting there and you're not sure what's going to happen, either now or in the future, and you're DEQ and you're like, you've been trained repeatedly by the EPA, you do what we tell you to do, you follow these rules, or we're going to either take the power away or we're going to take your money away from your state, and you don't want to have to answer people like me as to why suddenly we lost money and why didn't you follow the rules, what do you do when you're this lady trying to do what she's supposed to do to help out under the order, the, the District of Columbia. That's the reason why this bill is important, because that lady didn't have any choice in her mind or her company. I, I, I know it wasn't your decision, <laughs> but her company didn't feel like they had any choice, notwithstanding the fact that they were told in advance DEQ is not going to go in that direction. And how do you make all that work? I mean, people, we've heard the testimony today that people think it's not necessary because everybody worked together, but they didn't work together. We, in, in at least 50%, of the cases that have happened in the last 30 years, they didn't work together. And in enforcing EPA regulations that DEQ was authorized and supposed to enforce, the company who provided power to make sure that DC didn't go to, uh, down the tubes uh, for a period of time gets fined. Now, let me tell you something. Here's my problem, and I think Ms. Raggio would agree with me. That's a sense where every common person in this country. They might say, we don't want the pollution, we don't want this, we don't want that, but everybody's going to look at that situation and say, that's not just. And part of our jobs as members of Congress, and we fail at this a lot, I've only been here two years, I'm trying to straighten it out, but we are supposed to set up rules that if you're a citizen of this United States, whether you're a, a human being or a corporation, if you follow the rules that are coming down, you don't get punished. You may not agree with the rules. You may come here and lobby to change those rules. But if you're following the rules, you don't get punished. And we have a situation 
where without language like this bill has, somebody was following one set of rules and got punished. And so my concern is, how do we solve that? Ms. Raggio, and, and, and I apologize, Mr. Briggs, but you opened it up there right at the end. Ms. Raggio, do you see it any different? Is there anything I haven't covered as to what happened in this situation? And you, we got about a minute. Did you all sense that DEQ was doing this on their own or because they had it drilled into their minds that they had to enforce these rules or else the, the EPA might take their authority away from them somewhere down the road? Um, I sat through the working together process. Uh, when this first started, we had EPA, DOE, Virginia DEQ, and Merritt in the room. Um, EPA said before the ACO they would enforce against us if we violated an ax. I turned to DOE and said, well, then I can't run under your order because they're going to enforce against me. And DOE said, well, then we'll put you in jail. Okay, so I it's better to fi face a fine than it is jail time. I guess. Um, I thought, well, we're I all used to represent criminal defendants. It is better. <laughs> <laughs> we're all from the same government here. So uh, the federal government worked it out, and DEQ continued throughout the process uh, saying they did not believe that DOE had the authority to order us to run in violation of their limit. It was a legal issue for them. They filed very clearly in response to the DOE order. I don't know what their intent was. I don't know if they felt threatened by EPA. I can't testify to that. But I can say they were true to their word throughout the whole process. And, of course, Virginia citizens didn't want the pollution. And, of course, they weren't the ones that were going to have the blackout. So that created another dilemma that should have been at the federal level resolved. And this bill would help take care of that problem, wouldn't it? Yes or no? Yes. I yield back my time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman yields back, and seeing no members seeking recognition, we're at the end here. So the chair wants to thank the witness so heartily for coming here and giving us your time, your expertise. We greatly appreciate what you're giving us uh, this opportunity to ask questions of you. Uh, for all the members, the record will stay open for 10 days um, for some sort of statements. And without objection, this hearing is adjourned. <laughs>